Well, we are live. We'll be live here in just one moment. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I am your host, Chris Spangle. We bring you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves where while putting people before political parties. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective with the goal of leaving you better informed. Please be sure to rate us and review us in iTunes and now the Google Play, uh, the Google Podcast app. We're, we're there. And subscribe on Patreon at wearelibertarians.com. In exchange for supporting our program, we give you all kinds of bonus content and free stuff, including an extra hour this week, and then there will be another hour of Loki Wall from Harry. This show is crowdsourced, so you can send us news in our Facebook group or Discord channel, which you can find at wearelibertarians.com. We're always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians.com. Please be warned that this show is raw, unedited, and authentic, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive. I wouldn't say it's a family show, Harry, but, uh, you know, sometimes I can't, well, I can't help it. <laughs> Harry Price is my co-host tonight. Harry, welcome back. It's been a nice, uh, it's been a long month without you. Yeah, it's been a very long month. Um, some of my demands still have not been met. The coffee maker has still not been installed here at the Wall Studio. There will no be no coffee. And um, I'm very upset. Still upset. But, you know, decided to come back either way. You well, know. You, uh, <laughs> man, I was going to make a joke that would immediately end <laughs> in the program, but I'm not going to. Harry, uh, I had to keep reminding people that you were you were not gone because I hadn't fired another co-host uh, <laughs> or one hadn't rage quit, mm -hmm. but you, you had work to do, right? I had a lot of work to do. Um, my company is currently moving from the... Uh, east side of Indianapolis to downtown Indianapolis. So, yeah, so I'm trying to, you know, working with vendors, getting things moved, getting things installed, upgrading get different equipment, installing different things. And that, yeah, that's actually what I did today. So if I seem kind of out of it, it's because I've been installing the network equipment into the rack. Well, I actually put the network equipment in there. I've just been doing the cabling today. So right. I've just been on, you know, looking at an imager, looking at cool designs and making sure my cable management is perfect and beautiful and not like a gigantic rat nest just in case something happens. You know, Cable management is really important. It is. It is. Especially if something's not going to move. Yeah. I, I have, a, I mean, I don't do a great job, but uh, I do have some level of cable management. There's some Velcro Where? ties. Where? You know what? I don't need judged by you. You're. This is the problem with you IT people. You're judgy. Well, first off, I'm just judgy. You know, <laughs> a lot of other people like Reinhold, you know, he's very, like, fatherly and just, just go, this is, oh, I see what you're trying to do here. We could get you something else to help. Right. You know, me, I'm just going to look at you like, whoa, start over. Just start over now we are uh let's we're streaming to our big facebook page yeah how do you feel about that harry be uh, honest upset um you know betrayed hurt betrayed, yeah hurt yeah um you know just disgusted really so um, there's there's like eighty eight thousand people on this page mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, i would bet that most of you have no idea that we have a podcast mm -hmm. that we've had a podcast for six years right uh, we're, this is episode 294. We're dangerously close to 300. We do an episode twice a week, generally. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are, we, we basically talk about current events and apply libertarian perspectives to them. And you can find all about uh, the podcast at wearelibertarians.com. Uh, we have a set of 10 principles and we lay out what we believe and how we operate. 
Uh, and you can find us in any podcast app, anywhere that uh, anywhere that you find any podcasts. I think that you will enjoy it. We we try to mix humor with, you know, opinion and a v- variety of libertarian opinions. We are mm-hmm. uh, we are not uh, Harry is an anarchist. Yes, is that fair to say? That's fair to say. How would you identify yourself? You could identify me as an anarchist. What's That's your fine. liberty gender? <laughs> yeah, I think like anarchist. No, well, if you had to put like people's like, oh, you're, you're an anarcho capitalist, and it's like if you have to put one, I'd go for Afro anarcho monarchism. Uh, friendship is mandatory. Right, and I would say that I am a constitutional libertarian. Uh, I, I, okay. I. I'm almost to an anarchist. I just can't get to the private courts, but I also recognize that, hey, the reality is that probably in my lifetime we won't have an anarcho-utopia. I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Not so, in your lifetime, not in my lifetime. So we try to have a a, a broad range of opinion. There's about 20 millennials here in, in, yep. in the Indianapolis area that rotate onto the podcast, and uh, basically it's like you get to listen to a group of friends chat Mm-hmm. about politics and you get to join in and uh, we would love to have you subscribe to the podcast and uh, go through the back archives and i think you'll see tonight um i put a prep doc something i've never done before i put a prep doc in one of our notes so if you're on the facebook page and you go to the notes tab you'll see the prep doc with literally 200 links to articles i didn't read all of them i read about 50 different articles trying to get at the meat of this thing yeah because there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of opinions, there's a lot of biases, there's a lot going on here, and uh, there are going to be points where we kind of repeat some of the same information uh, just to kind of give you a perspective. Uh, but we wanted to put it up on the big Facebook page because, frankly, we wanted you to know that we, we have a podcast, which is the main thing that we do. The The Facebook page at this point, I'm going to be very candid with you. We just shit post on and post memes. And Stone Aldridge is our social media manager and does a great job posting memes on our Instagram and mm-hmm. Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and because that prep doc spent hours yeah. researching, trying to find what was the right information. Mm-hmm. I probably shouldn't do this on camera too much, Harry. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Screenshot. Trying to... Uh, what do you think I was trying to do? Get on YouTube. <laughs> So, real quick. you know, hours into researching and trying to find out the truth and do, do, figure this out and you put this all together and you post it and you're like, well, surely people are going to love this Four shares, a hundred, uh, several likes mm-hmm. better mm-hmm. than the normal two that we would get on something that is an actual piece of research. The reason I hate our Facebook page, and I don't think that this is our people. If you're if you like our page and you're watching, it's not you. Uh, it's just generally Facebook is that. If we post something that is a serious piece of research or an article with a well-thought-out opinion based on years of political experience, I've worked in politics and media for 15 years. Uh, I have, uh, I know what, you know, I've worked for the Libertarian Party for four. Mm -hmm. I've worked for news talk shows as a reporter for four. I've, like, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, You sure just wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. I read this thing on, on, uh, on uh, PatriotPost.us. (laughs) <laughs> and <laughs> like uh, people on our Facebook page and m- mostly the internet don't want actual information. They just want shit memes to argue over because they want themselves to be heard. Mm-hmm. And I hate it. And then we get these long winded, I'm unfollowing you guys because you don't represent libertarianism very well. It's like you wouldn't know libertarianism if it came up and crawled up your behind. Uh, so I'm grumpy about it. Yeah. So mainly, I just wanted to do a Facebook Live here to tell uh, the face. We've already lost like forty people, which is what I'm good at. Mm-hmm. Stone Stone grew the page like two thousand in a couple of days, and then I I lost us a thousand in the next. Yeah, by posting like one meme, not even a meme, like an article, an, an article. article, yeah, an article, article, right, article. So I would love the tenor Sorry. of our Facebook page to match our podcast, is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. But people don't want that. Oh, so. that's the other thing weird is like when it's like a you can post like a. a Awful meme, like just a dumb meme. It's funny if you're in the know. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's if been you're... downloaded and shared 400 <laughs> times. That they want research, and that's where the, the people <laughs> want the the hard end research. This is false. And this is fake news. Did it? It was like, where was you on the article that we spent time actually going over and researching and looking right. at? Nah, screw nah, that. Fuck. This this yeah. meme you did in MS Paint real quick on the toilet. Oh yeah, this is what right. we're gonna argue about. Re- 
Yeah. It just explodes. Yeah. 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 And then like the worst about it is because like you get these like these ridiculous like um people talking about like well some of the younger people are, are, who are new to politics are not going to know about this trust me the younger person in the audience that is watching this podcast knows how to right click and reverse image search okay right. trust me they can reverse they reverse image search all memes to, val to validate all memes that make claims <laughs> this was to make fun fun okay i know i know i we try to be funny and we try like use the page mostly just to share memes because they're funny and yeah. that are politically related hoping that maybe you'll see the name and connect that we have a podcast, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know that I've ever met anybody who, if you are one of those people who follows the podcast because of the Facebook page, that's how you found us, let me know, but most people just find us on iTunes. But yeah. So we wanted to say welcome to the Facebook people, uh, and I figured uh, I have a lot to say about the border separations. Uh, I have done a lot of research on it, trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, this is a hot topic that not a lot that, that I, I've sensed the hunger for information from regular people. So I am here to talk to the regular people. Yeah. All right. I'm here to talk to the people who want to know what's going on, who are not just here to be anti left or anti or anti right. Mm -hmm. They're just it doesn't matter what this is some of these people that you argue with on Facebook about this. It's well, the Democrats did it. It's like, well, OK, no, the Democrats didn't do it. Here, here's the 15 reasons why, and that, like, that's the thing about immigration, and and it happens when you argue with partisans on both sides of the issue, is they never. It's why it's a waste of time really to argue too much on Facebook, because they're never going to change their mind. There's actual studies that show arguing on Facebook completely is a waste of time. Like it just you're never going to change that person's mind. There is some value in people reading the thread. Mm -hmm. And the comments and the arguments back and forth, mm -hmm. uh, and it can help. Like a lot of this show and what information I pulled is really to was helpful to see what other people were saying. But on immigration specifically, it's one of those things where if you have somebody present a concern or an argument, and then you give them information that satisfies the question, they then switch to another question or concern. Mm -hmm. And then when you answer that, then they go to another one. Right. <laughs> and it's just it's like there's never a, a resolution. It's always I'm just going to be anti-immigrant. And like at a certain point you go, OK, you're not looking at this from a perspective of what economics might say or what statistics say or what government officials or charities say. Like you're just stuck in this mode of thinking. Or past choices that you have made personally and or decisions that you have made. Like right. everything we, you can talk to about someone on the past, you try to take those exact same positions that they have and like, okay, now let's go to this same situation and apply your exact same principles that you claim to have and you flipped. You flip. You're, you're, you're like, nope, now you see it this way. Now you see the government needs to have power. And now you're, you know, now you're ready to full on state control needs to control this thing. And, you know, before you were crying, you cry, small government libertarianism, government needs to get out of the way on everything else. Now, <clears throat> I'm not an open borders person completely. Okay. Um, and, and we will talk about open borders, closed borders, immigration policy after we talk about child separation. Mm -hmm. But for all the bias hunters out there who can't stand to listen to anything without knowing where the people stand f first, okay. um, I would definitely, I think this this episode completely illustrates closed borders are a fantasy and are inhumane uh, but I, I'm I'm open borders in the sense that I don't believe that you should uh, just in the way that I don't believe that I should be able to tell Harry what he can and can't buy I shouldn't be allowed to tell Harry who he can and can't employ so labor coming into this country when you increase the labor supply then you increase the demand for jobs, you increase the demand for goods because those people in those new jobs are buying goods. Mm -hmm. You look at women coming into the workforce from the 50s through the 90s, they created entire new industries like the nonprofit industry. The, the economy didn't suffer. So, uh, But I do have a, a sticking point. I do think there should be a citizenship test. So when it comes to voting, for instance, um, that is, is – I'm a little bit more of a stickler. So – I would be in favor of a worker work visa program. I think what Bush outlined in 2006 was pretty decent. I think you disagree with me. No, no, no. I see with it because a citizenship is more of like a club membership, and as you vote for part parts of a club, right. that makes sense. 
I can see that. From a pure libertarian standpoint, libertarianism is about open borders. Yeah. And yes. I, I'm flat out telling you that I am I'm giving you the compromise position mm -hmm. uh, in what I outlined. But the pure libertarian perspective is that you, you, you shouldn't put any boundary on the flow of migrants in any way because as people – leave for new economic opportunities, new economic opportunities grow. Um, doing that, you're just putting the, a block on the flow of the market. Right. The, oh, you're putting basically price controls in place. You're, it, it's, a different word, it's, a, yeah, it's a different word for price control. It, it borders are tariffs. Yeah, they're right. just tariffs. They're tariffs on people yeah. and labor. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So that is, that, is, that is where we're at in terms of bias. Okay. Now, th so that is where we're going. Go ahead. I'm, yeah, because... Uh, uh, I'm an open borders kind of person, mm -hmm. just like Chris says. I, I, I actually, I actually found myself almost agreeing right you know, there with that incomplete statement. Right. I was like, yeah, I can agree to with that full statement. Oh, then the, the, you know, the government controls and stuff like that. But that all makes sense. Right. It's all perfectly fine. Like to and and the understanding that all that other stuff does not happen in a vacuum. Right. So. Let's talk about that. But to me, this issue, I, I, I will I will get to it after we kind of give you the facts of what's going on. To me, this is not an immigration issue. This is really a, about a principles and values uh, about what this country stands for and how we treat people. Um, and so it's less about immigration. And everybody wants to ha argue about immigration. And I don't want to argue that. I'm, I'm like, uh, but we'll get to that. Let me give you the facts um, from the Washington Post and Vox. These are the two who wrote it the clearest. Uh, and the only ones who really wrote out the laws, uh, Rich Lowry from uh, National Review also wrote out about the laws, but Lowry really spun it in a way that was favorable to closed borders Republican politics. And and when you hear the facts, you kind of will we'll look through his piece a little later and you'll kind of hear the bias creeping in and exactly how he wrote it. Um, so this is from the the... 1776, lock down this bitch. Bruh, do you understand anything about the founding of this country? <laughs> when you are... <sighs> Harry. 1776, lock this bitch. This is why we shouldn't be doing this on the big Facebook page, because you people aren't ready for freedom. <laughs> My people came over from Germany in the mid-1800s as part of the migration in the mid-1800s that gave America the labor force to have an industrial revolution, for instance. The, the immigration to start keeping people of different ethnicities out of this country began in the 20s. Okay? <laughs> so before that, America was fairly open borders. Remember Ellis Island? That's pretty much how it happened. So 1776, lock this bitch down, not historically accurate. Yeah, not I, invite, historic. I invite yeah. you to know what you believe. Yeah, and being historically accurate, um, like James Neese went off into a tangent. It was like, it's also not unusual for the United States to have people having like whole territories speaking a different language. All right. All right. So uh, in that prep doc, I have put these articles and I put a ton of videos, podcasts about this, other articles uh, from both the right, the left, the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, um, debates about immigration. You can see that in the notes tab on the Facebook page or at WeAreLibertarians.com if you're listening later on the episode. Uh, so I have given you literally every single decent piece and argument about this entire issue in that document. All right, so you can go and fact check me till you're blue in the face with my own research. All right, but so out of all of that, I'm I'm presenting to you the articles that give give you the consensus view of what's actually happening. Reporters who are on the ground in the area, people who are researching the law, trying to figure out what the hell's going on. So the facts about Trump. This is from the Washington Post. The facts about Trump's policy of separating families at the border. So uh, they write, the president and top administration officials say that U.S. laws or court rulings are forcing them to separate families that are caught trying to cross the southern border. These claims are not true. Immigrant families are being separated primarily because the Trump administration in April began to prosecute as many border crossing offenses as possible. This, quote unquote, zero tolerance policy applies to all adults, regardless of whether they cross alone or with their children. 
Now, it's in quotes because the zero tolerance policy came from Stephen Miller, who is the 32-year-old advisor to the president who is reportedly the architect of this particular piece. He, uh, he believes that 90 percent of Americans, if immigration is the central issue, that 90 percent of Americans will vote for Trump's side on immigration. And so let's all realize that both sides are playing politics with this. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the Republicans are trying to look tough on the border before the midterms because Trump and, and Stephen Miller and his and Jeff Sessions, who Stephen Miller used to work for, all believe that immigration is a winning issue. And with no border wall being built, they want to look tough on immigration. And so they have changed their policy in the last four months to uh, to this zero tolerance policy in an effort to look good in the midterms. On the other side of the aisle, Chuck Schumer and the Democrats are not allowing a vote and holding votes on DACA recipients uh, from passing because they believe that it looks bad for the president that he will soon start deporting uh, DACA students, and they want to make the president look bad. So both sides are playing politics with this, and and your Facebook friends are blaming Chuck Schumer or they're blaming Donald Trump. They're both wrong, all right, as usual. The Justice Department can't prosecute children, the Washington Post writes, along with their parents, so the natural result of the zero-tolerance policy has been a sharp rise in family separations. Nearly 2,000 immigrant children were separated from parents during six weeks in April and May, according to the Department Department of Homeland Security. The Trump administration implemented this policy by choice and could end it by choice. No law or court ruling mandates family separations. Let me read that again. No law or court ruling mandates family separations, despite what your Facebook friends have said. And I will explain that to you in the coming paragraphs. In fact, during the first 15 months, the Trump administration released nearly 100,000 immigrants who were apprehended at the U.S.-Mexico border, including a total of 337,500 unaccompanied minors and more than 6,100 family members. Children continue to be released to their relatives or to shelters, but since the zero-tolerance policy took effect, parents, as a rule, are being prosecuted. Any conviction in these proceedings would be grounds for de- deportations. So the change in policy is not any policy uh, or law or, or court ruling or anything in the last four months. The only thing that has changed is that the Trump administration is now treating anyone who crosses the border uh, as someone who broke the law. Now, crossing the border uh, is uh, a misdemeanor offense. Okay. And... The way that you were supposed to come in is you were supposed to walk up, present yourself to a point, a point of entry, uh, and say that you are seeking asylum, which we will explain. And so the, the controversy surrounding the children specifically are families who are seeking asylum. And the Trump administration last four months has made an insidious change, meaning a bad change, uh, that they are not allowing people to seek asylum, which is technically against American law and international law that Americans helped craft. So uh, a misdemeanor is, uh, for a first-time crossing offense, it's like a speeding ticket. Uh, If you're a second time or multiple time trying to re-enter, then that is a felony charge. Um. Shooting down, Um, the Justice Department under Obama prioritized the deportation of dangerous people. Once he took office, Trump issued an executive order rolling back much of the Obama-era framework. Obama's guidelines prioritized the deportation of gang members, those who posed a national security risk, and those who had committed felonies. January 2017 executive order does not include a priority list for deportations, and refers only to criminal offenses, which is broad enough to encompass serious felonies as well as misdemeanors. Then in April 2018, Attorney General Jeff Sessions rolled out the zero-tolerance policy. When families or individuals are apprehended by Border Patrol, they're taken to DHS custody. Um, So, again, April 2018, they changed the law, and uh, they they, uh, apprehend anybody who crosses in... uh, the, they go into DHS, Department of Homeland Security Custody. 
Uh, DHS officials refer any adult, quote unquote, believed to have committed any crime, including illegal entry, to the Justice Department for prosecution. If they're convicted, they're usually sentenced to time served. The next step would be deportation proceedings. Illegal entry is a misdemeanor for first-time offenses. Um, a DHS fact sheet says any individual process for removal, including those who are criminally prosecuted for illegal entry, may seek asylum or other protection available under the law. Families are essentially put on two tracks. One track ends with deportation, the other doesn't. After a holding period, DHS transfers children to the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement in the Department of Health and Human Services. They spend an average of 51 days at an ORR shelter before they're placed with a sponsor in the United States, according to the Health and Human Services. The government is required to place these children with family members whenever possible, even if those family members might be undocumented immigrants. So the hilarious part is that when the parent is taken to a lockup, and, and essentially what's happening there, they are taking, when you walk in, and let's say you know Harry and I walk in, mm -hmm. and he's got his wife and his daughter, Ru uh, Gunther. I almost called her uh, Gunther. <laughs> uh, so uh, there, I, I threw myself off. I'm sorry, Harry. Um, so Harry walks in with his wife and his his newborn daughter, year old daughter, mm -hmm. and then I walk in with my nieces who are two and four. Okay, now Harry and I would go into a pen together mm -hmm. because we're two men. Your wife would then go into a pen. Mm -hmm. In some facilities, the one-year-old would be allowed to stay with the mother. Mm -hmm. If they're breastfeeding, in most cases, they get to stay. In some cases, depending on the border guards mm -hmm. and how nice the border guards are, i.e. policemen, <laughs> the one-year-old will be in, in a, a, a basically a cell you know, a chain link fence with netting over the top mm -hmm. with other female children. So they put women, adult women, adult men, young boys, young girls in four separate groups. So my two-year-old niece and my four-year-old niece would almost certainly be in the pen with the young women. Not with me, not with even women. They would be... A, alone, together, and according to government policy, they're not allowed to touch. So like some weird children of the flies? That's, that's how it breaks down, okay? And so, like, everybody freaked out over all those images in 2014 of the kids in the dog kennels mm -hmm. uh, under the Obama administration, uh, and then it turned out that was from 2014, and everybody acted all self-righteous, saying, "Ha, huh, that's 2014. How dare you share fake news? That's what actually is happening. It still is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. it's, just, it's just the most updated because they stopped photos being taken there in 2014. <laughs> they don't allow press They in. just now are letting uh, press in, but they're not allowed to bring cameras or photos. Any photo you've seen has been released by the government. Uh, they're... Now, just now in this past week, letting in legislators and senators. So, <coughs> got to make the uh, you know the the uh, reelection rounds. Yeah, right. Politicians grandstanding. Um, so there there is something called the Flores decision. Uh, the we'll get to that. Let's just keep going on this story, and and I'll fill in the facts as we go. Um. So after they spend an average uh, of 51 days, then they're, they're placed with family. Um, adding it all up, this means the Trump administration is operating a system in which immigrant families that are apprehended at the border get split up because children go into a process in which they eventually get placed with sponsors in the country while their parents are prosecuted and potentially deported. This is a question of Trump and his cabinet choosing to enforce some laws over other. The legal landscape did not change, and the Trump administration released nearly 100,000 immigrants during its first 15 months. Then they changed the policy, my editor's note, just in time for the midterms. 
uh, what changed was the handling of these cases. Undocumented immigrant families seeking asylum previously were released and went into the civil court system. But now the parents are being detained and sent to criminal courts while their kids are resettled in the United States as though they were unaccompanied minors. The government has limited resources, and so they cannot prosecute every crime. So setting up a, Senate, a system that prioritizes the prosecution of some offenses over others is a policy choice. So, <clears throat> in other words, they are choosing you have to, everybody who is screaming the law, the law, the law. I'm seeing you know it all roll through yeah, the comments, right. and it's nothing but they broke the law, send them back. Your cousin gets busted for pot. Well, there's there's multiple ways. <laughs> How many of you have had a family member busted for drunk driving? Do you have a family member, Harry, that's been arrested for anything? Yeah, yeah, drunk driving with dad, yeah. Okay. So y- y- dad goes before the court, mm-hmm. and the prosec- there's multiple choices at different levels, okay? So when your dad goes before the prosecutor, the prosecutor depending on multiple factors, being his, his first offense, or is he going through counseling? Has he gotten, has he gone through a diversion program? Has he, uh, is he an upstanding member of the community? Did he hire enough uh, lawyers to help him get off? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, the, there's a, a Netflix show right now called The Staircase, okay. and it's basically like this guy just buys a million dollars worth of lawyers. It's amazing how, how much it costs to... Uh, buy back your freedom um so the prosecutor can then decide what crime to charge the person with and then you go to trial and along the way there could be a plea deal or there could be a lessening of charges or a removal of charges or even an adding of charges along the way then they go before the judge the judge then has the ability to alter any of those agreements and then decides how to sentence people so it it is very easy to sit there and say, "Well, they drunk drove, so they broke the law." Slam the book at him. Okay, but there's multiple factors involved in any criminal prosecution, or even any civil prosecution. There's there's a bunch of different aggra- aggravating factors that go into every decision, and so what Donald Trump has decided to do is throw the maximum penalty at every drunk driver. Your cousin gets, but you get busted for pot. You know, you you could be facing three to five years for uh, possessing marijuana, and they could attack on an intent to distribute charge Mm -hmm. for fun, and you could be charged uh, facing three to five years for a felony, but then you only get charged with uh, misdemeanor possession. Okay, there's should they should a person who is uh, buying pot (laughs) be in jail for three to five years? The societal costs of locking every single person up and giving them all the maximum uh, penalty is massive. Right. The cost of of detaining all these children is extraordinary. There's an article somewhere in my prep. Um, yeah, like about yeah, but, the actual cost. I I don't think I have it. Not out. Yeah, it's it's, it's ridiculous. Like yeah. the, the the budget they're blowing through. Like, yeah. It's, up in the yeah, it's six figures. So They're just blowing through it, quick. So this is the one place where I see a lot of people say they broke the law because they think it's very black and white, and you don't understand shit about the law, frankly, and you sound like a dumbass to those of us who do understand how the law operates, and y- you you have to understand that when you commit a crime, there's so many different choices that a government can make and how they prosecute that crime. And so what the Donald Trump administration has chosen to do, to do is take a very radical approach in not only violating American law, but also international law on how we handle asylum seekers, mm-hmm. uh, but also uh, in effectively closing the border in multiple ways, which we'll explain in just a moment. So, so yes, they broke the law, but in the same way that you break the law when you don't wear your seatbelt— it's literally legally at the same level <laughs> yeah. of crime. Yeah. So you, you get caught with a speeding ticket See, uh, that's non-felonious, and we get to come in and take your kids. Yeah, 
making Facebook comments while you're driving. Right. He's giving felonies thing. for misdemeanors. That's basically uh, whoever yeah. that is. I can't see who is commenting, but you're right. Yeah. Um, so uh, the Department of Homeland Security sent a number to wa- the Washington Post. Uh, Waldeman sent figures from fiscal 2010 through 2016 showing that out of 2.3 million adults apprehended at the southern border, uh, nearly 500,000, or 21 percent, were referred for prosecution. So during the Obama administration from 2010 to 2016, and you know how you all post how Barack Obama deported more people than anybody else, 21 percent were actually prosecuted. So... In the old days, you could basically get picked up, and then you would be uh, granted a civil court hearing for asylum. They would hear your asylum case. You would either get to stay or you'd have to go back. Now everybody's going back, uh, 100, as close to 100% as they can manage uh, instead of 21%. So that's why this has become a crisis <laughs> because – it's the order of magnitude of more people that are being apprehended and held, and, and it fills up. There's 57, I think, a day. Uh, I, I saw some number that it's, uh, yeah, so it's 40, 40, 45 children are being taken from their parents each day. Uh, so it, it's a massive number of people as opposed to the brief period. So the other misnomer that you keep hearing, the other falsehood that you keep hearing is that this has gone on forever. It's not gone on forever. It, there was a brief period during the Obama administration that this did happen in 2014, and it was an extraordinary outrage. It was a big, big cry. Glenn Beck and, and Ted Cruz took teddy bears to the border uh, zone, and, and it only lasted a few months. Mm-hmm. So it, didn't, it hasn't gone on forever. Again, your Facebook friends are wrong. Um, so... The administration officials have pointed to a set of laws and court rulings that they said forced their hand. A 1997 federal consent decree that requires the government to release all children apprehended crossing the border, the Flores consent decree began as a class action lawsuit. The Justice Department negotiated a settlement during President Bill Clinton's administration. According to a 2016 decision by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth District, and I would say the most liberal of the circuit court judges, The Flores settlement requires that the federal government release rather than detain all undocumented immigrant children, whether they cross the border with parents or alone. The agreement doesn't cover any parents who might be accompanying those minors, but it doesn't mandate that the parents be prosecuted or that the families be separated. Moreover, Congress could pass a law that overrides the terms of the Flores settlement. Waldman said that the Flores settlement requires the government to keep immigrant families together for only 20 days, but no part of the consent decree requires that families be separated after 20 days. Courts have ruled that children must be released from detention facilities within 20 days under the Flores consent decree, but none of these legal developments prevent the government from releasing the parents along with the children. The other law that they cite is the 2008 human trafficking law called the TVPRA, the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, which was signed by President George W. Bush. This law covers children of all nationalities except Canadians and Mexicans. Central American children who are apprehended trying to enter the U.S. must be released rather than detained under the terms of the TVPRA, and they're exempt from prompt return to their home countries. The law passed with wide bipartisan support and was signed by George Bush. Now, the origin of all of these laws is the 1952 Immigration and Nationality Act. So Mr. 1776, who claims that the country was founded on closed borders, the modern immigration system was founded in 1952, essentially, under the Immigration and Nationality Act. This comprehensive law governs U.S. immigration and citizenship and makes a person's first illegal entry into the United States a misdemeanor. Clinton, Bush, and Obama, the presidents who were in, the, in office during the immigration boom of the past few decades, never enforced the INA's illegal entry provision with the Trump administration's zeal. The INA says nothing about separating families. It was sponsored by Democrats and passed by a Democratic-held Congress, Harry Truman, also a Democrat, tried to veto the bill, 
but uh, saying that it was a reactionary and un-American measure meant to keep out immigrants from Eastern Europe who are fleeing communism. Uh, Congress overrode his veto. Um, so <coughs> what you have is uh, a, they kind of highlight <laughs> the silliness mm-hmm. of the way that the administration – there are three different arguments coming from the administration on this policy. And it really shows you the absolute incompetence – with which the Donald Trump administration governs. Oh yeah, M- most govern- uh, government handles incompetence. But the other thing is, like, it also like this entire thing just like to me, it just keep. It's not no one's looking at like the numbers are adding up because the thing is, right? Yes, the the families are being separated, but according to everything I'm seeing, is that means the kids are being left in the, in the United States and the fa- and the parents are being sent back. Yes. So so, so now you've got kids here, right? That they're here in the United States with a lot of the Dreamer Acts going things going through. Mm-hmm. They probably are going to get their citizenship here in the United States. So their parents are going to come in that way. We will. We, Very long and convoluted, but like, you just backdoored them in. We're just now talking about the child separation. There's so many different layers but yeah, to this. Yeah, yeah, wait yeah, until yeah. we get to Sorry, I, I put my chip down too far in that layer dip. I'm wait, sorry. wait until we get to what sorry, happens I'm to the just, kids because just, you. The, what happens after this 20 days is amazing. Yeah. It's, um, so the three different strains of argument coming from the administration. Um, Trump is distancing himself, uh, saying the Democrats gave us this law. Uh, Nielsen, the uh, Department of Homeland Security uh, secretary, says it's not a policy. And the reason she's saying it's not a policy is that if the Trump administration is sued, it's much harder for uh basically what the Trump administration is saying, that this is a consequence of these other two laws, and we're just enforcing the original INS, or the INA Act, uh, as it was written, we're enforcing the laws where other administrations have not enforced the law, and uh, we're beholden by the Flores Decree and the TVPRA, and this is just a consequence. It's not a brand new policy. We are not dictating that uh, children be separated. It's just a consequence, not a policy. Because it's harder to sue a consequence, right, than it is a policy. If it's a forethought-out, intentional piece of legislation as opposed to just a bad bad outcome, then it's it's, it's a harder case to make for the opposition. So that's why she's claiming that it doesn't even, it's not happening, it doesn't exist. And Sessions, the uh, Attorney General, is... Basically, like uh, vigorously defending it. <laughs> so, uh, we do have a policy of prosecuting adults who flout our laws to come here illegally instead of waiting their turn to claim or claiming asylum at a port of entry. Jeff Sessions said, We cannot and will not encourage people to bring children by giving them blanket immunity from our laws. Uh, in another speech in June, on June 7th, he says, um, I hope that we don't have to separate any more children from any more adults, but there's only one way to ensure that is the case. It's for people to stop smuggling children illegal. Stop crossing the border illegally with your children. Apply to enter lawfully. Wait your turn. The Attorney General also suggested on June 7th that the legal developments are forcing his hand because of the Flores Decree. Um, essentially, for Trump... This is leverage that he is using to get congressional funding for the promised borders. So all of this is doublespeak. It's Orwellian doublespeak that is meant to confuse and, and is a, just a very crass way of constructing policy. Uh, and, you know, they're, um, they're not taking – t- Donald Trump is not taking any responsibility – at all, and I think it's because the public backlash really caught him off guard. Right, he wasn't expecting this. Right, he wasn't expecting people to. He expected people just to, you know, do that drive-by, like just hear numbers, understand that look how many people they're going, they're keeping out. But what they was not prepared for was the PR backlash of people seeing kids being separated from their families, but even at a young age. Like people, you know, if it was just like, you know, the 15 to 18 year old kids, you know, you know, like high schoolers and but the babies and the, you know, the 
tweens and the little ones are still with their moms and stuff like that, mm-hmm. I think it'd be less backlash. Right. But for the simple fact that because I know myself, I'm thinking like I'd be damned if you separated from my one year old like that. Ab- absolutely. Well, that's part of the problem is I don't think people are. I certainly don't think that Donald Trump views them as human beings. Do you? I don't know. I don't know if he does. I don't think he does. I, I, I don't know. Here, here's what I, I don't think. know. I think that Donald Trump, if he were, I think that if Donald Trump were flown to Brownsville, Texas today, and he were walking through there, Donald Trump would change his policy immediately. Oh, instantly. I think that Donald Trump, I, like, I do think on on some level he's a total sociopath, and he's he's in a lot of ways incapable of the emotional, like, of empathy and in many ways that narcissists are. But there is a thing with Donald Trump that when he sees something like children crying in person, it changes. It's like he he wants to make a change and fix it. He wants people – he's kind of like – well, he he's done this before in the past. Right. He did this in twenty uh, when he first got elected. That once you you know like with this the the gas attack, it's like once you see these kids like this, you have to act. Yeah, and I think either he's not being shown or lied to the situation that's going down there. Right. So because they know he would act because he's still human, even with all those traits, we know that he's human and he he, can, he does not like seeing kids hurt. Right. So that that but at the same time he's shielded from a lot of that because I think he has people around him who have just a vested interest in yeah you know like Stephen Miller this is he's beating off to the coverage every night mm-hmm. like this is just who he is um uh, something we'll touch on again later uh this is from a Vox article called Family Separation at the Border what you need to know about Trump's alarming immigration policy According to federal defenders, some Border Patrol agents are lying to families about why and how long they're being separated. A federal defender told the Washington Post's Michael E. Miller that parents were told their children were just being taken away briefly for questioning. Liz Goodwin of the Boston Globe cites a defender saying that in several cases the children were taken by Border Patrol agents who said they were just going to give them a bath. As the hours passed, it dawned on the mothers of the kids that they weren't coming back. So... When you're in the detention facility um, and you are separated, here is how they actually get the kids away from the mothers. Uh, so I read this last night, and I've been passionate about this, and I will explain why soon, but this is, if you're a parent, this is tough to hear. Um so let me find the actual actual piece here. I apologize. Harry, how are you doing today? <laughs> You're fine. Uh, I'm actually been like going through here, like also pulling up uh, different uh, cool little quotes and, fa- and uh, not quotes, but uh, uh, chat comments and saving them for later. And then okay. right now I've been also been pulling up little things to help like educate some of these people. All right. So here's what we'll do. If like you, the if, whole idea of uh, like the, the, the U.S. Constitution only applies to U.S. citizens, which is that's a falsehood. It's, all mean, right. What, so if you leave a comment on the Facebook uh, on the Facebook page there, then uh, we will answer your questions and, and discuss sort of what you're saying uh, towards the end of the episode. I will also say that if you're a Patreon subscriber, we have a Patreon, which you can find at WeAreLibertarians.com. Uh, $10 a month and up, you get to watch every show live like this, and you get to comment in the chat room. So uh, this is from a great article. Like, If you want one article that breaks everything down completely, it is this it, TexasMonthly.com is where you should go for your coverage. No one has had better coverage from both the human angle, the legal angle, on the ground reporting than Texas Monthly. Uh, it's a magazine in Texas. Man, they get a lot of pickup truck money, and they are well funded. They're a great, they're a great magazine, and they have done great reporting on this. And this article uh, is an interview with someone from the Tah- Tahira Justice Center, which I have linked in our show notes. And they, they're, they're basically a legal defense fund for people trying to navigate amnesty, or not amnesty, asylum in the United States. And uh, this is a long article, but it really lays out everything that's happening in a much, uh, I think, more personal way than that Washington Post article. 
Uh, so if you if you only have the attention to read one thing or if you want to share what's going on, what's really happening when asylum-seeking families are separated on June 15th at TexasMonthly.com is your article. <clears throat> um, so for you rule of law folks, here's the thing. Here's a huge part of all of the problem with this is – And this is one of the fundamental problems with Donald Trump and his administration. And this is one of the problems of complete inexperience. Mm -hmm. And any libertarian president or libertarian candidate that got elected would probably fall into some of these same traps. When you go to execute a policy, you can't just decree it so. (laughs) You can't just say, "I, I speak this into existence, let's make it happen. Uh, And that's kind of what happened here. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump just decided, and along with Jeff Sessions and Stephen Miller, that they were going to do this, and they kind of let the chips fall where they may. They didn't increase the amount of shelters. They didn't lay down guidelines for Border Patrol. They didn't lay down guidelines for DHS, ORR, or any of these other agencies. They didn't prepare anyone for anything. They just changed the policy and let it happen. Correct. And what you have you for you follow the law people is you don't end up in that situation with people executing the law. You end up with rule of man. So the difference between the rule of law is that society agrees upon a certain amount of things, a certain set of standards, a certain set of laws and principles, and these are the laws that we're all going to obey, and the laws are clearly written on how those will be executed, and here are the penalties if you don't. Rule of man is when men in the moment are making up whatever they want to make up. See if you hear that in this. So again, this is an interview with uh, Ann Chandler. <clears throat> Should have tweeted it first. That makes it law. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the process for separation? There is no process. Judging from the mothers and fathers I've spoken to and those uh, staff that I've spoken to, there are several different processes. Now, again, this is a woman who is who is directly interacting with all of the people that are in the news as they try to get asylum. She's their lawyer. So she's on the ground and uh, in the actual con- uh, holding facilities, knows all the border agents, all that stuff. That's why Texas Monthly is great. They're on the ground and they know who to talk to, so they've talked to all the right people. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they, there are d- several different processes. Sometimes they will tell the parent, we're taking your child away. And when the parent asks, when will I get them back? They say, we can't tell you that. Sometimes the officers will say, because you're going to be prosecuted or because you're not welcome in this country or because we're separating them without giving them a clear justification. In other cases, we see no communication that the parent knows that their child is to be taken away. Instead, the officers say, I'm going to take your, ti- take your child to get bathed. That's one we see again and again. Your child needs to come with me for a bath. That's not disturbing. Uh, Oof, the, child yeah. goes, the child goes off, and in a half an hour, 20 minutes, and the, the parent inquires, where's my 5-year-old? Where's my 7-year-old? This is a long bath. And they say, you won't be seeing you won't be seeing your child again. Sometimes mothers, I was talking to one mother and she said, don't take my child away. And the child started screaming and vomiting and crying hysterically. And she asked the officers, can I at least have five minutes to console her? They said, no. And in another case, the father said, can I comfort my child? Can I hold him for a few minutes? The officer said, you must let them go. And if you don't let them go, I will write you up for an altercation, which means that you are the one that you are, the one that had the additional charges charged against you. So threats. So the father just let the child go. So it's a lot of variations. But sometimes deceit and sometimes direct and just I'm taking your child away. Parents are not getting any information on what their rights are to communicate to get their child before they are deported, what reunification may look like. We spoke to nine parents on this Monday, which was the 11th, And these were adults in the detention centers outside of Houston. They've been separated from their child between May 23rd and May 25th, and as of June 11th, not one of them had been able to talk to their child or knew a phone number that functioned from the detention center director. 
None of them had direct information from immigration on where their child was located. The one number they were given by some government official from the Department of Homeland Security was a 1-800 number. But the phones inside the detention center, they can't make those calls. We know there are more parents who are being deported without their child, without any process or information on how to get their child back. Texas Monthly. So it's entirely possible that children will be left in the country without any relatives? Could be, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if the child is, say, five years old, the child is going through de deportation proceedings. So the likelihood that the child is going to be deported is pretty high because they know they're going to ask for asylum. Uh, oops, I apologize. I skipped to the wrong page. How do they know where to deport the child to or who the parents are? Well, how does the child navigate their deportation case without their parent around? Well, Texas Monthly says because a five-year-old doesn't necessarily know his parents' information. And says, in the shelters, they can't even find the parents because the kids are just crying inconsolably. They often don't know the full legal name of their parents or their date of birth. They're not in a position to share a trauma story like what caused the migration, so they can't even ask for asylum. These kids and parents had no idea. None of the parents I talked to were expecting to be separated as they faced the process of asking for asylum. You'd think there'd be some sort of wristband or something with their information on it. Mm -hmm. And says, I think the Department of Homeland Security gives the kids an alien number. They also give the parents an alien number and probably have that information. The issue is that the Department of Homeland Security is not the one caring for the child. Jurisdiction of that child has moved over to Health and Human Services. And the Health and Human Services staff has to figure out where is this parent, and that's not easy. Sometimes the parents are deported. Kids are in New York and Miami. We've got parents being sent to Tacoma, Washington, and California. Talk about a mess. And nobody has a right to an attorney here. Nobody here has the right to an attorney, she says. What? These kids don't get a paid advocate or an ad litem or a friend of the court. They don't get a paid attorney to represent them. Some find that because there are programs... Uh, some find uh, some find that because there are programs, but that's not a right. It's not universal. So, Harry, as a parent, what do you think about that? Uh, it makes me sick to my stomach because, like, even like uh, when we go to the hospital with um, Gunther, when they take her and they've got to take her either like away from us or something like that, they wristband our child and they wristband um, my wife and I with mm -hmm. the exact same copy of the duplicate wristband. Because our daughter's not going to know our information. So they make sure that I have the copy of the same wristband that's on her. Right. Makes everything simple. But they're used to dealing with that type of situation. They've gone through this. They're also a private entity, being a hospital. Well, public private, you know, because it's a hospital. But it's just... And then to... Sorry, the comment section on here is just like... Brutal, Listen, but, uh, these people are not MS-13, okay? Yeah. But the kid that is separated from his parents and massive traumas happening to him at three years old because he's mm -hmm. separated from his parents for 70 days, Yeah. that's the kid that grows up to be MS-13. MS oh, yeah. Oh, you yeah. Fucking moron. Oh, yeah. That's the kid that grows up on the streets without, has. I don't know who my parents are, gets deported, go back to El Salvador, just, you know. Gets into the cycle of violence. Well, that the parents I, I are can't to imagine that I would grow up angry at the United States government if I were these people. Pretty much, pretty much, but yeah, it's it's that type of it is is very short sighted and it's typical of government thinking that oh we're just going to do this. But the other thing was like is it's also like not knowing the area too when they set forth this policy. You can tell that someone has never been down there mm -hmm. or understood what is going on and also give them the doubt didn't understand like a ramp up was going to happen in the past like month that it has happened. Yeah. They had no idea some the, of this every, stuff. Everybody was happened. completely unprepared for this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And even like um, El Salvador was unprepared for like a lot of the disasters they've been, ha they've been facing. So they have no idea where most of their people have went because of the stuff that's going on. Right. Um. These are. This is not MS thirteen. These are. This is. Th th that's not how this works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And okay. MS thirteen was formed because of um, uh, gang members going into this 
the um, well, not gang members, but uh, from uh, people from um, those Latin communities being placed in the jail system, and they formed a small gang to protect them from the Crips and the Bloods. And then when the um, American immigration policy changed in the 90s, started to deport a lot of these people who were part of the same gang back to um, the home country that they have never been to because they were kids when they were brought over here and they were brought there and they brought that same gang mentality back there with them that they learned from the Crypt and the Blood. Which yeah. So basically, our, uh, American domestic policy created MS-13. In, in in an indirect way, absolutely. In, in, yeah, in an indirect way. I'm not saying that it's the sole provider. You're case, blaming it, America. It's a catalyst. It was a catalyst. It's a catalyst. It's a catalyst. You're, this is the same way. The you're cat- just a Soros libertarian. It's the same way the catalyst that the United States uh, have invented most gangs and stuff like that. It's the same way. It's like the Crips and the Bloods were created to protect themselves from different organizations, uh, the, the uh, police or just um, c- low ridden crime areas, but then the United States government with the prohibition on illegal drugs made it profitable to trade in illegal drugs in people. So that's what they did. So they have was a catalyst of creating these two massive gangs. So also, just, just also like the, um, in the 1920s, they're catalyst on the Italian mafia. Um, so I want to keep giving a few more facts. There's still more facts to this. And then we're going to continue on in that vein. And we're going to explain how we got here, where we're going, how this pol- uh, uh, we're going to talk about a lot. We're going to talk about the war on drugs and its effect and all this, uh, because there's a lot of, of layers to the analysis to this. Uh, but, I want to get the facts on the table uh, first, so I want to read you a pediatrician's view into a Border Patrol processing center. This was posted today by Marsha. It was an interview by Texas Monthly by Marsha Griffin, co-chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She is a part of that group, a special interest group on immigrant health, and her job is to work with 500 pediatricians to study the effects of um, – basically, they, they – study the kids who uh, grow up in these traumatic environments back in uh, Central American countries and then talk with the 66,000 pediatricians in their group about how to specially care for these uh, kids. Um, so so she has been inside of these uh, detainment facilities a lot, and she does say that uh, – so when – when a, uh, maybe we should go to the beginning here before yeah. – maybe walk through the process. Um, so, you know, let's, uh, let me go here. Um, and we'll kind of get to the, to more facts as we go along. Yeah. The bean dip is deep, as deep, isn't it? (laughs) There's so, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to stick with, with what I wrote out and I'm going to stick with the, the, the actual show notes that I put together here instead of getting ADD. Um, but. I think fundamentally you have to when we're, when when I look at news stories, I look at it from a libertarian perspective, right? Mm-hmm. And the libertarian perspective says people first. Okay, when we're interacting with others, it is how do you and I in, interact in an individual way? How do we interact with our government? Mm-hmm. And when we are when we are involved in politics. Politics and politicians and votes and policies and our tax dollars are all an extension of our values, not as a collective we, but as an individual we. Mm-hmm. When I vote, I vote my values. I vote my principles. And I think the reason that this makes me so crazy is that this is uh, in direct conflict with pretty much everything that I have believed about America in so many different ways, which... Uh, you know, I don't view this as an immigration story. I view this as um, a values story, a gut check time for where we're at in America. We have politicians using childhood trauma as a bargaining chip. We are essentially using terrorism as a deterrent. The real goal of the Trump administration is, is to get the word to spread back to other countries through our media and through their circles that if you come to America, you may permanently lose your children. And they want the media to show the pictures of crying children. 
That has been the intent of the policy, according to Stephen Miller. The American government is terrorizing children for political purposes. It is the antithesis of the non-aggression principle as a libertarian. The non-aggression principle is the ultimate defining axiom for libertarians. We do not advocate using force as to achieve social and political goals. You don't have to agree with this policy. If you say this is wrong, it doesn't mean you're for open borders. <laughs> okay? And there are some people who, when you say this is wrong, they go, you're just for open borders. No. You don't agree with this? You're for... <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm against terrorism. I'm against it when ISIS kidnaps children mm -hmm. and holds them hostage right. for political purposes. I'm against it when the United States government does it. And I have a really hard time understanding how people don't see the same thing I see. Yep. That and that to me is even harder than watching the images. That there are so many people in this country that are not not just okay with this, but actively defending it and proud of it because of the others mm -hmm. being punished. The Those others. aren't human children to them. Right. What is that, Harry? I I don't know. It's and it's disgusting because like it's and it, but and it's all based on this idea that well we have to know who is coming in and is going out. Properly vet these people. Got to properly vet them. What the heck does that even mean? Okay, well, if the, if that's what you believe, then how is that being uh, accomplished here? Because we've, one, already, yeah, yeah. we've already heard that this is a complete mess. Right. They're losing children. They've, right. they've lost tens of thousands of children in the last few years. Correct, yeah. And prop and and if properly vetting is is your key, then why do you why are you breaking up these these families and separating them this way? Right. That's that seems in, now it's an improper way to vet them because now you you know separating them to these groups like this. The other thing with it is like if you just want to know who comes in and who comes out, we can do that with a you know 4K camera and a, and a sign-in sheet if you really if it's all you want to know who's coming in and who's coming out. Like, I've got a sheet of paper. Well, it, it's see, you're arguing things that Republicans and conservatives said in 2012. They don't realize that they have gone from we need to keep track of people in this country mm -hmm. to now we don't care what happens, even if it's terrorizing children. Get the fuck out of our country. You're not people. Right. You don't realize that that's how you sound and that's how far you've drifted, dear listener, mm -hmm. uh, a Facebook viewer. But that's where you're at. Um. So how did we get here? Uh, yep. And, it, it, and the, oh, sorry. And the other thing is, one thing is, you don't see the people that will never. They, for some reason, don't think they'll ever be in that type of situation themselves. Right. That's the other thing. It's like, how would you feel if you did that? Well, it's like, no, 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 no. It'd be very, very quick for any country to have a downfall or something like that, and you need to go somewhere. Where are you going to go? Let's say, you know, Libertopia, you know, New Hampshire becomes this great bastion of freedom, and that's the only thing that's left. Where the heck do you think you're going to go? Right. How would you get to that board? How do you want to be treated? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that's really what it comes down to—the golden rule. I mean, as a as a Christian, my my politics are informed by my religion, and uh, I sure as heck wouldn't want to be treated like this. I I wouldn't, and I don't want others to treat children this way in my name. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's it's just the basic golden rule. But how do we get here? It is generations of people. Voting in a way, you have to understand that I think sometimes when we talk about public policy, we have disconnected the right now from the eventual consequences or from any consequences at all. Uh, someone, said they'd rather, <laughs> someone said they'd rather die than live by Roger Paxton. Hilarious. Um Yes, individuals choose their behavior, but governments set up environments with perverse incentives. And one of those perverse incentives that the government has created over the last 50 years is through the drug war. So the U.S. government really declares war on drugs in the 70s. Why? Nixon 
you think Trump is bad? I just listened to the Slow Burn podcast by Slate. It's a and a, it's a great podcast. If you're into politics, you'll love that podcast. And you realize that Donald Trump is a choir boy compared to Richard Nixon. Nixon was hands down of all the presidents I've studied. After listening to that, I'm like, holy crap! This like if you compare Watergate to the Russia investigation. Trump has been very staid and has let the process continue. <laughs> and, you know, he found a hope you find a way in your heart. Nixon was, ho- oh, you just got to go listen to it. Um, <clears throat> and so Nixon basically wants to, uh, according to his chief of staff, who later said this in the 80s to Rolling Stone, they needed to criminalize their political opponents in blacks and drug takers, pot smoking hippies. Mm-hmm. And so they begin the war on drugs to. <laughs> weaken their political enemies. Yep. Uh, I apologize. I've had laryngitis, so my voice gets kind of dry sometimes. So as they ramp up the war on drugs, the policy causes gangs to profit off of a black market like alcohol prohibition in the 30s. Why did, why did bootleggers and Al Capone pop up in the 30s? Because you prohibited a substance and then a black market grew around it. Uh, And then military interventions by the U.S. in the 1980s destabilize Central and South American countries further. We pump these countries full of weapons and money, and then we incentivize those countries to start fighting drug cartels. The drug cartels, who already are flush with cash, buy weapons, Mm -hmm. and then these countries devolve into civil war. Uh, I think I read somewhere that we gave like $2 billion— uh, to uh, Guatemala or El Salvador. Is that $2 billion in today's money? That sounds kind of high for the 80s. I'm talking about in 2016 Okay, that we did that. Well, what? Yeah, Ooh. I think we'll get it to in this article uh, here. Um, I stay, I stay too, you know, stay too right. much of the 80s stuff. Sorry. Oof. So Oof. we're going to give you a, sh- a ton of weapons, but don't kill each other. <laughs> don't kill each okay. other. Um, so well, the, 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 okay, the, 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 uh, the native populations reject colonialism and they reject foreign intervention, just like we would reject foreign intervention. And they start electing these populist dictators that are going to promise to solve all of their problems. But what they don't realize is these populist dictators are funded and set up by the drug cartels. Mm-hmm. And so then eventually the governments merge with the cartels and you just have this massive amount of cash and, and weapons. And so over the course of the 90s and the 2000s, uh, the 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, you have a, de- a de-evolution of of the situation in these countries. Yeah, it, it, it just shows you the, the reach and the power of the United States government. The United States domestic policy, what they do inside its own country, is affecting other countries. Absolutely. You know? And... It's, it, it, yeah, it's it just like, yes, there is this such thing as American exceptionalism. Yes, it's powerful. It's so widespread, it affects the world. We are an exceptional country because of the values that we are founded on, which are free markets, mm-hmm. um, which are yeah. free markets, respect for individuals, the rule of law, n- mm-hmm. a, a, a no caste system, yep. that everyone is equal in this country. Not because we have the biggest military and not because we have the most money right. and not because we have white culture like Donald Trump really kind of try like Donald Trump. Those are the reasons I think he thinks we're exceptional, but those are not why we're exceptional. We're exceptional mainly because, yes, our money, but because we have free markets that yeah, we give everybody market. a chance yeah. in this country to succeed. Yeah, correct. Yeah. There's a lot of very, very smart Scottish people and we've taken their ideals and have ran with it. Yep. OK. And. When you and that has influenced countries that don't take those types of ideals to heart and then have these control economies, so they just see something that's like, Hey, if we do this, we make money from those people, right. let's just do this one thing, and they control everything to do this one thing, yeah, to get money for themselves and not build up anything else because they have no incentive to build or anything else because they already control everything because they have a caste system. So at the same time that we the war on drugs is happening in those countries, we also are locking up more and more people for possession, drug car, you know, drug pushing here in the country, mm-hmm. uh, and the the prison system explodes, and gangs basically run the United States prison system at this point. Like, yeah. and in the eighties, Latin gangs started popping up as more and more Hispanics started going to jail for selling drugs, for trafficking drugs. 
And the, those gangs, those prisons were run by black gangs and white supremacist gangs. And so naturally gangs sprouted up. The MS-13 gang was um, a Salvadoran gang, for instance, that began in L.A. as a response to mm -hmm. protect the members of that black market who are selling drugs. Mm -hmm. And eventually they get locked up. They serve their time. And then after, they're, after they've served their time, they get deported back to their countries. Uh, mm -hmm. So we end up shipping gang members back, and then the cartels grow <laughs> grow stronger <laughs> by uh, by sending all these these violent elements back. Um, now you fast forward to now, ninety nine percent, ninety six percent, or some crazy high number of what is actually uh, busted at the border, what drugs are actually caught at the border, ninety nine percent of it's pot. So yeah. as states have begun to legalize weed, then the drug cartels are starting to hurt. Mm -hmm. And so what they've done is they've started to diversify their portfolio. Not only are they taking over state-run operations like oil fields, they're also getting into human trafficking. And that's why human slavery is on the rise. It is because of gangs in Africa, in some parts of Asia, and in some parts of South and Central America. Yep. And uh, so for decades, immigrants to America generally were uh, were young men who were coming here to work in fields. They were here mm -hmm. for seasons and then they'd go back for seasons. Uh, you know, they were seasonal workers and they were basically snowbirds. Yeah. And it, it still happens, by the way. Right. Absolutely. And then they uh, and then they would send the money back to their home country called remittances. Mm hmm. And that's how Donald Trump proposed he was going to build the wall, was these remittances. And, uh, but now we're seeing a trend where there are more and more women and children coming to the border uh, because they're fleeing the sex slave trade in their home countries. Uh, for instance, preteen girls make up a big part of the new population because they migrate to avoid grooming gangs. So it's always hilarious to watch the same people who talk about Tommy Robinson and grooming gangs in Europe mm -hmm. Uh, how they don't want to let in preteen girls uh, and grant them asylum as they're fleeing the same grooming gangs in South America because we don't want to let them in. Uh, that's that's just a very stark, clear example of how your thinking is not clear and you're not consistent in your values. If right. you're against grooming gangs and, and sex slavery in Europe, then you should be against it in Central America and you should want to do something to help. Mm -hmm. If preteen women were fleeing Norway because of grooming gangs... Islamic grooming gangs, you would let them in in a heartbeat. But why wouldn't you let the Salvadoran girl in? Why do you think that is, Harry? Well, the uh, Norwegian girls would be closer to six foot tall, so all our D1 volleyball teams would go <laughs> up. You know, make sure we stay, you know, like uh, Olympic viable. Right. Um, the shorter El Salvadoran girls, they won't have that. But their arms are longer and harder, so our softball teams would be even better. That's some level to just trying to bring some funny fun laugh laugh to this whole right. depressing topic but like the, the biggest reason is because like well you know possibly they're white possibly they're you know they probably a, a, they they'll fit more into quote unquote the they they look the the correct amount they can blend in easier at least into most people's societies can so when you're seeking asylum uh usually you stop at the first country you can go to and for many of these countries it's mexico and mexico is no safer than their countries although el salvador and uh, honduras and guatemala are now the most dangerous countries on earth yes uh mexico is still not much of a better choice they're still they're they're, they're now seeing a record killing of politicians in mexico right and they only to be perfectly honest they only like you if you're mexican there right they Hispanics are very racist against each other. It's not even a joke. They're very big. They're they very a, biased. They have a caste system too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they they have different opinions on basic on people on how much Spanish blood is in you versus how European oh. and Spanish you are. Well, here's the crazy thing: is that yeah, it's it's a Catholic society. <laughs> like the, these people who don't want Western society to be eroded by all these furners coming in. It's like you don't want the uh, pro-choice or the pro-life 
uh, religious Catholics Mm -hmm. who don't want gay marriage, who are entrepreneurial coming in, who are of European descent and Catholic religion. These are Western people. Yeah. They're just browner than you. Yeah, they're just browner. They're basically European. Yeah, you're right. They're European hardcore Catholics. They're the hardcore Catholics. Right. Um, And how dare... uh, No, 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 no. If they're coming to America, they're playing softball, not soccer. Yes, that's right. Um, So... So uh, most choose America for obvious reasons, because of security and economic opportunity. And let's face it, America has America can take it. <laughs> like, America is not a fragile society. For all the hysteria of the left, for instance, America is not a fragile society. We have the ability to absorb large amounts of people. We accept already 1.1 million immigrants every single year. And have you noticed that big of a difference? No. It's because we are a very durable society with a lot of economic opportunity, and as unemployment drops, we need more and more employees. For instance, trucking industries are begging for mm-hmm. people right now. Yes. Uh, and when Alabama, for instance, tried Ooh. to ban all illegal immigrants, there they had just watermelon patches dying because there was no one there to pick it. Oh, yeah. And so they tried to hire white and black workers that were American, and they quit within an hour. Yeah, there was a, like a great story. No, no, no. They weren't trying to hire them. They literally went to and got parolees. It was either jail or pick these watermelons. Right. Right. They chose jail. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. would too. Yeah. And, Alabama's um, hot right When now. I was working in that, uh, when I was working at the warehouse, right, we just started like, I remember when that law went through, we just started getting applicant, applicant, applicant. We went to 100% empl- uh, 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 employees because we, all these people from Alabama just showed up. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, and they had the work visas, you know. Right. They, 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 they hey, we filed out the paperwork correctly. They could work. And we, psh- Boom, warehouse was 100%. We were rocking and rolling. So you have all these th- these people. Go ahead, sorry. I was going to uh, respond back to Kristen Rodriguez in the comment. She said, and don't call us Mex- Mexicans of well. When I hang out with my cousin and um, my um, half-sister or, you know, half you know, Puerto Rican, the only time, the only place they ever are actually identified as Puerto Rican is when we're in Boston. Everywhere else, it's either <laughs> Mexican, Honduras, Guatemalan, or Cuban when we're in Florida. Right. So... Uh, and, and leaving their home, especially in Africa, but also in Latin American countries, leaving their home makes them social pariahs in their hometown, mm-hmm. and it marks them or their family members for further violence. I think yep. if you if you listen to the Daily, the New York Times podcast this week, and they talked about uh, Barack Obama opened up asylum for domestic violence victims, and this woman from Africa was telling her story about her abusive husband and getting asylum, and now she's here, she's fallen in love, she can sleep at night. She was basically given to another, given to a man because he paid the dowry. Mm-hmm. He bought her like property, and then when he was abusive, she fled to her parents' house. The guy drove his truck into the house, and then when she left, the family had to provide another woman because he had paid the dowry. So she's like, I hated to leave because I knew one of my cousins or sisters was going to have to suffer the same abuse, but I was going to get killed, so I had to leave. And so those are the kind of stories why Barack Obama opened it up, because in many of these third world countries, the patriarchy rules like that, that uh, those kind of stories like you, you hear about India, for instance, mm-hmm. and the pink gang in India as they protect women of sexual violence, police and governments shrug in third world countries towards violence towards women. You know, so the all the of all the talk about the oppressive uh, Western society and toxic masculinity, it's like. You realize for the first time in human history, Western civilizations are the one who ended the dowry, who ended, su- who gave suffrage, who uh, like opened up the workforce to women. Like we're the ones pulling the rest of the world towards liberty and freedom, and that's why people just get so annoyed. Yes, everybody wants women to have equality. Yeah. No, we don't want to be subservient. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Am I speaking your language, Harry? No. Yeah. Yeah. Because. Yeah, the reason why most people get annoyed is like, yes, we sue you. Point out here in Western society, okay, you really can't. Please go after them. That's right. who needs it. That's who needs it to be educated. The, that, the those, pink those, gang in India needs help. Yeah, they need funding. Right. Go help them out. So why aren't they armed? Why can't we give them a billion of guns? So I, I look at this and I go, why are we turning our backs on asylum seekers? These preteen girls who are fleeing grooming gangs in Central America, who are fleeing MS-13, are not MS-13. 
I saw someone comment, well, how do we know they're not compromised? Sure. I'm sure there there are some instances of the administration being right and some of the cases that the sessions people put out there saying, you know, this one guy brought in these sex slaves and that probably happens in a very fractional percentage of these cases. But you can't let that fractional percentage on the fringes of the actual numbers drag you to a point where you let the vast amount of decent people who are fleeing dangerous situations completely distract you from the reality of the situation. That's why I have such a problem with Donald Trump on this issue is that he is completely detached from any statistics, any reality on the ground, any understanding of the historical nature of of why these people are suffering or why they're leaving. He just doesn't get it. Yeah. And when these people walk up to seek asylum, this is what's happening now. So when Do- when Jeff Sessions says, you need to come to this country legally, when your Facebook friend says, you need to come to this country legally, here's what happens when people try. Yeah. Prepare to be pissed, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> so again, from Texas Monthly, June 3rd, 2018, Uh, Border agents are using a new weapon against asylum seekers. As the temperature reached 105 degrees, three Guatemalans made their way north Saturday on the Paso del Norte Bridge linking El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, seeking to claim asylum in the United States. On previous attempts over the past day, they had been met at the Long Bridge's apex by Custom and Border Protection agents, a highly unusual tactic who asked uh, they normally are not met, who asked them for identification and told them they couldn't proceed to the port of entry because the holding cells were at capacity. This time, the three migrants, a badly sunburned woman, her baby, and a 16-year-old girl, 16-year-old girl who was not related to them, were accompanied by two representatives of Annunciation House, an El Paso organization that has helped migrants and refugees for more than four decades. Once again, they were stopped by two border agents, asked for documents, and then told they were not allowed to go further into the United States because of capacity issues. So began a tense standoff Saturday that marks an escalation in U.S. tactics to keep immigrants out of the country, including those legally entitled to enter and seek asylum, and relieve crowded immigration facilities that officials say are filled beyond capacity. Ruben Garciera said, who founded the Annunciation House, I know you're not at capacity. I know that's what you've been instructed to say. Uh, He knows many of the border agents and has a good handle on this. A recent law school graduate who is working with the Annunciation House told the agents they were legally required to let the Guatemalans make their asylum claim because they were already several steps inside the country, a boundary that exists at the bridge's apex. The two border agents, whose name tags identified them as as Armad... It's not relevant. Politely but firmly held their ground. I did that because I couldn't pronounce the name. (laughs) Garcia asked to speak to a supervisor, and they made the call. Before the supervisor arrived, another agent came up to the group. His name tag was obscured. The agent said they had been assigned to check IDs as people crossed the boundary line, a highly unusual effort coming at a time when President Trump is expressing increased frustration that his administration cannot control the national border, Uh, a key campaign promise of his. IDs are usually usually required a couple hundred yards further north as well into U.S. soil at the port of entry where people make citizenship and custom declarations and apply for asylum. And while the agents at the top of the bridge said they were checking the ID of all people walking across the bridge, Levy noted that the agents weren't checking many IDs other than those of people with the dark skin and threadbare clothing that is typical of many Central American migrants. By making asylum claims at a port of entry, immigrants are supposed to be given a court date, so that judge may determine if the asylum claim is credible. But recent reports suggest Central Americans are being turned back to Juarez. Ironically, Garcia said, many of these Central Americans have grown frustrated and subsequently decided to sneak into the U.S. outside of a port of entry, then gotten arrested by the Border Patrol. Uh, Then they talk about separating children. Uh, So this is what the government says is happening. This is a statement from the CPB. Regarding what you witnessed today, we are taking a proactive approach to ensuring that arriving travelers have valid entry documents in order to expedite the processing of lawful travel. 
That being said, CPB processes, processes undocumented persons as expeditiously as possible without negating the agency's overall mission or compromising the safety of individuals within our custody. The number of inadmissible individuals uh, CPB is able to process varies based on uh, upon case complexity, available resources, medical needs, translation requirements, holding detention space, overall port volume, and ongoing enforcement actions. No one is being denied the opportunity to make a claim of credible fear or seek asylum once space is available and other factors allow the officers to allow more people into the facility, they're allowed in. Um, federal law prohibits agents from turning away people who say they want to seek asylum, which is, men, which is means of legal entry into the United States. The Immigration and Nationality Act from 1952 that we talked about earlier states any alien who is physically president present in the United States or who arrives in the United States, irrespective of such alien status, may apply for asylum. That's the law. That's really clear. Okay, so for those of you who love the law, who are talking about how all these people need to go back where they came from and follow the law, that's the law. Any alien who is physically present in the United States or who arrives in the United States irrespective of such alien status, may apply for asylum. The group of Guatemalans gathered on the Mexican side of Paso del Norte Bridge were the latest to be caught up in the administration's efforts to reduce illegal immigration and clamp down on what it sees as exploitation of the asylum process. The group included several men traveling with their sons, a couple of teenage boys traveling without parents or guardians, a couple of teenage boys... Okay, mm -hmm. the woman and her baby and the 16 year old girl traveling by herself. Garcia and Levy introduced themselves and asked the migrants about their stories. They came from different villages and told similar tales of fleeing intense poverty, a corrupt government and violent street gangs who were trying to dragoon young boys. The men and their sons wept openly as they spoke. The young mother told Garcia and Levy that she had been raped in Guatemala. The only young girl in the group was more only the young girl in the group was more reticent to discuss what caused her to flee home. The pieces that she put out there was that she would go back to school and then she would lock herself in her room when she would come back. And I tried to get from her, why do you feel the need to do that? And I couldn't get an answer. Wow. You know anything about trauma, Harry? <laughs> because when a 16-year-old girl is unable to speak what happened to her, that means some pretty he heavy shit happened. Yeah. That's in oof. psychology. Yeah, she just shuts down. Just shut down. Um that's wow. So um so essentially then these border guards go on. Uh this this uh the, they keep trying to get asylum. They keep walking up to the bridge and a supervisor finally comes out. And his name is Gomez, and he says, we're absolutely saying that they cannot, we are not absolutely saying that they cannot make an asylum claim. We are just saying that we cannot process them at this time. When Garcia said the law required CPD, or the Border Patrol, to process their asylum claims, Gomez said, sir, I'm sure you know I'm following directions, and this is not even local directions. Gomez said, sir, I'm sure you know I'm following directions. And this is not even local directions. Where's your brain go to that? Where's your brain go, Harry? It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just that, like, <laughs> dude, are you? <laughs> Garcia wasn't buying it. I know by the numbers of migrants that ICE is turning over to us, there is room because the numbers are low and they have been low this whole week. He told Gomez. So this house, basically, the Annunciation House, when they. Uh, they cross the border for asylum claims. Normally they go to the Annunciation House, mm -hmm. or uh, if they can't get get access, then they go there. This is basically a safe haven where they can get food and shelter and clothing and access to the border. Um, Garcia and Gomez had been talking for about four minutes when Garcia asked, so right now, as far as they are concerned, I understand you, you to say you will not allow them to present for asylum. Then Gomez changed course. They are... 
as Levy pointed out, stepping on U.S. soil, so we are going to take them in to process their claims. Mm -hmm. They escorted them to the port of entry. By this time, some of the other Guatemalans had made their way up to the bridge. Four were standing inside U.S. territory, three including the father who had been separated from his sons earlier in the day, were on the Mexican side of the line. Um, two border agents who had been standing a few feet from the border stepped forward and stood directly on the line. I witnessed one of the agents take a step into Mexico to prevent one of the Guatemalans from crossing into the United States. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't do that. Well, if you want to follow along, yeah, you physically can. No, it's because it's a stupid imaginary line. But yeah, um, yeah, you, it's playing by his game. He can't do you that. You can't do that. That's, that's illegal. He broke the rules of the game that he's playing. The law is that if they if they present themselves at a port of entry, you legally have to process their asylum claim. Yeah. Uh, or just. Inside the United States, period. So Once you've crossed the imaginary line. So basically, Garcia says, all right, I'll, uh, we're good here. I'm going to go get everybody some food. Goes back to the house to get some sandwiches. He comes back an hour later, and everyone is gone. What happened to them? He said they went back. What happened to the one who were standing on the boundary line? Well, they went back as well. Seems odd, doesn't it? Yeah. Just, they just, just, just decided just, they, they made it all that way, and they just said, yeah, I'm going to go back to Juarez, Mexico. I'm not going to, yeah. Go back. So. Stinks here. So let's yeah. go back to the, yeah. te- let's go back to the detention center. Let's go it's back like, to a pediatrician's view into the border patrol processing center. So if they are able to follow the law and enter legally, then they go to what used to happen is they would uh, get a number, they get an ID, they get a court number and then they would be released, catch and release, as Stephen Miller has uh, so propagandistically called it. And then they would eventually be able to present at a civil court hearing to then outline their reason for asylum. If they were granted asylum, then they would be granted access to the United States. If not, they would be deported back to their home countries. Families were intact until four months ago. Now what is happening is even if these people get asylum they're all being put into detention centers Mm. even even the ones who came here legally and presented themselves at a point of entry the the multiple points of entry across the southern border over the last four months have essentially effectively been closed without congressional approval donald trump has closed the southern border now you may think that's a great thing but here's why it's not Because the law of the United States, passed by the Congress of the United States, Mm -hmm. representing the will of the people of the United States, says that's not how the law works. And you don't, as president, get to just decide what law you want to follow and don't follow. You don't get to just wave a magic wand and close the southern border and completely change international and federal law because you feel like it. Because you need to do well in the midterms. Plain and simple. He's violating the will of the people. Uh, two things. One, the moose should have told you America's closed. <laughs> yeah, the moose out front <laughs> should have told you back at the beginning of Mexico. Yeah. And um, I am the Senate. Hey, that's exactly right. So there's people right now on the Facebook cheering this. You're in violation of the United States law. You're, you're actively cheering the violation of the United States law. The- you're overriding the will of the people of the United States. You are traitorous. 1776, I'd shoot you right in the face. I'm just kidding. I wouldn't shoot you. You're not traitorous, (laughs) but you really do need to rethink your position because... Bullet's expensive. Right. 1776. Yeah, 1776, closed borders for the win. No, yeah, you can even watch like old Western movies. They'd cross to Mexico all the time and cross right back. Right. I don't care. I don't care. (laughs) I have a friend on Snapchat... Well, She's up in Montana, and she crossed. She walked right over into Canada and walked right back. Yeah, well, the, like in um, Vermont, there's a library that goes right through the um, right through the border. It goes right down, to, right through the street. You um, you could even you have neighbors that are technically would be in Canada. It's just right down the middle of the street, and you can't supposed to. In, in order to cross the street, you've got to walk down the street to the port of entry to get into Canada to go see your neighbor, which is right across the street from you. So most people just take the misdemeanor and just walk across the street. This commenter makes a good point. 
It's the Canadians we need to worry about. As I have repeatedly said for years on this show, 97% of them live on the uh, American border. Mm -hmm. They send their spies in, those little geese that mm -hmm. fly around, the, the drones. Mm -hmm. The drones. They send in, the, they try to trick us into liking them with people like Michael J. Fox and uh -huh. Alan Thicke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm, not, uh, I'm not buying it. Well, yeah, we need it, to watch them. Well, like, the, that's the goofy thing about that is the... Uh, the whole like closed border port of entry is like there's so many people that drive between different borders between Canada and the United States all the freaking time just to do things in on this side of the border or the other side of the border. Okay, so if we do admit them, they go to the detention center, and we talked a little bit about what was going on in the detention center, but here's a little more detail. Um, so can you talk about this? Is from the uh, Pediatricians View into Border Patrol Processing Center from Texas Monthly. Uh, can you talk about food, punishment, contact with parents, sleeping arrangements, that kind of thing? Yeah, well, let me say in the processing center itself, they give them thin mats to sleep on the concrete floor, and they give them a Mylar blanket to cover up. And they sleep in the chain link enclosures that many call cages in their groups, and they give them meals. They're not warm meals, but they give them three meals a day. They can take a shower... They have a change of clothes, and their clothes are washed and given back to them if they want them. But they're not allowed to stay with siblings if they're of the opposite gender? Right. Not while they're being processed within that facility. Children are not supposed to be in that facility longer for 72 hours, and then they're supposed to be um, moved to be released with their parent if that's what they decide to do, or taken to the ORR shelter, which will care for that child until they can make arrangements to find out who sh they should be placed with. Um, that ORR shelter, all your uh, Facebook friends are posting of the pool tables and all that stuff, that's the ORR shelter. Those do have, um, they're, they're basically built for this. They're not detention facilities. Mm -hmm. So when they do go to these detention facilities that everybody, you know, the chain link fence that your liberal Facebook friends are posting about, while well, your Republican friends are posting the ORR shelters. <laughs> so, right. but the the argument that they're getting, you know, pool tables and video games and field trips, these kids are are still openly weeping and crying. And, like, you don't give a shit about a pool table when you don't know where you're at, who you're with, where yeah. your parents are, and when you're going to see them again. Mm -hmm. Like, it just, you're, you're, you're an idiot if you say that sort of thing. You right. just, you're not making any sense. You're just thinking with your... Uh, bias yep um so she she talks about the mental state a little bit now uh basically my concern is the trauma that is being caused in that processing center when they are separated and when they're separated from their families and so i can describe in december of last year i took several pediatricians in with me to view the processing center again and when we were outside they were talking to us about the facility what we would see where we were going where we couldn't go that we could just go in for a certain distance and which would they basically brought them in. And when we were brought in, you could hear the voices of children, but you couldn't tell what they were doing. Uh, then they opened the door and we went in and we saw that there were these enclosures and the one right by us within six feet was an enclosure that was locked around with 20 or 30 10 year old boys who were crying and screaming and sobbing for their mothers. And some of them were reaching through the chain link fences as if they were trying to reach out to their mothers and screaming. One little boy had his, black, his back to the wall and was slumped in to control his sobs. It appeared that their mothers, since the boys were screaming for them, were in incidental cages about 50 feet away, unable to get to their sons or help them. And between them, there were desks where Border Patrol agents were sitting working at their desks at their computers. We suggested that they should get a child specialist to help these kids get some comfort and talk them through and help them process this, a specialist could talk to the children and help get them through that very scary thing of being separated from a parent and not being able to get to them. And we were told that we didn't understand, that they were law enforcement. That's not what they did. They're not a child care facility. They don't do that, and they don't have time to do that. So what effect does that have on a child? It can have a really long-lasting effect on them, especially this level of stress and trauma. And when you as a parent can't see them or can't be right next to them and you can't comfort them and explain things to them and they can see that you're unable to protect them, that affects the attachment of a parent with a child because a child thinks that they can trust their parent. 
that they can be protected. And if they can't, then that takes a while to reestablish that attachment again because they don't know who is safe. And when they're afraid for that long, even though 72 hours doesn't seem like that long, for a child, that's an eternity. And it will kick off the extreme toxic stress reaction into a child's body. And it's much worse in a child than in an adult because a child's brain is still developing. And so you have that high level of stress hormones flooding the brain. It will change the brain structure. It will make the child more vulnerable for long-standing hypertension to cardiac disease. Just because of the cascade of stress hormones and its reaction in the body for fight or flight, it can cause certain cancers. It can cause obesity, long-term problems for children. And that's why you so, see so many pediatricians across the country speaking up. It's because we know when we see these things, when we see the way they are being treated, we know what the effect's going to be eventually, and we have to help them now. What ages did you see? All ages. Babies. Newborn. How are they being cared for? They're all in cages. A mother would stay with her infant if she was breastfeeding the infant. They would be together in those enclosures. And that's it. Wow. Uh, um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and I think people make the, the cute, convenient excuse because they don't want to hear that. They don't want to accept the fact that they are paying the taxes that sets up that structure mm -hmm. that is causing that terror in that child. So then they say, well, it's the parent that's responsible for bringing them here. For, for the people fleeing these countries, this isn't even a deterrent. Yeah, that's nothing. Because this is not even close to the constant terror, the, the risk of the travel. Staying is certain death in, in yeah. these situations. Yeah. And you, if you read the stories of the immigrants that actually come here, staying is certain death. So the risk, it's kind of like you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Right. And so I think people try to rationalize this kind of trauma towards children by saying it's the parents' fault because they don't want to accept any responsibility that their tax dollars, that their politicians, that their government is doing this. Pretty much. And the, it is the – because in the countries that they're coming from, every situation you do, everything like that, that's nothing. Yes, you, you may try to wrap yourself in the blanket of – well, that means they're better off. That chain link's better than the, you know, like the shanty house that you're probably living in. You're probably right. But the, the mental trauma that you're just separating families, that's the issue. Yes, they're incapable of dealing with it. They're incapable of dealing with it because they made a very rushed decision that and, and bypassed U.S. law. Right. They'd rather take this risk. Yeah. Um, yeah. So... I want to talk about the morality of the, this because the other thing that always just shocked me is is that the border agents that are sitting at their desk, watching, listening all this happening. Yeah, that that's really one thing that stuck out to me is, is that there's a desk. The, these uh, these guys are basically like sitting in between these terrorized children. And mothers crying and children crying, like that—that's <laughs> just ignoring it and drowning it out. And there's actually an article from Vox that kind of addresses this uh, from a psychologist. Uh, his name's Bernardo Zaka, a research fellow at the Center for Ethics uh, at Stanford, mm -hmm. and he talks a little bit about uh, judging the the decisions of bureaucrats. And I think this is uh, an important piece of this because we're seeing a lot of third world authoritarian strains within this story and I'm not saying Donald Trump is literally Hitler because that's stupid I, I'm saying that there are there are certain patterns in authoritarian regimes and structures that 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 end up creeping in and if they're not checked mm -hmm then they continue to grow as a cancer. Right. And bureaucrats carrying out emotionally traumatic things to them mm -hmm. and just getting over it is, is one of those things. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. There, there, yes. There is there's a book called Into the Darkness about the guy who ended up running uh, one of the concentration camps, uh, Treblinka, I think it was. And he basically talks about his journey. He sits down and tells every piece of a story in this book. And he talks about his journey from a police officer in, I think, Austria to being the head of Treblinka. And how did how did he get there? How did he end up there? Because mm-hmm. he was just a regular police officer. You know, Sheriff Joe down the street who ends up head of the concentration camp. Mm-hmm. And he felt such immense guilt for it that he wanted to do this book to atone and to teach other, like, here's how it happened. There's a book called Ordinary Men that Jordan Peterson talks a lot about, where it's these ordinary police officers and security guards who get recruited to go out and just mass execute people. And in this book, Into the Darkness, he's just a bureaucrat, government employee, and he feels... um he feels kind of hopeless about his situation. He's not. He obviously doesn't want to be a Nazi, but he feels that in the beginning that his his life he has no choice. It's either do this or be killed, and he doesn't have the strength to say no, and he does it anyways. And Jordan Peterson talks a lot about this. Every single one of us listening, Harry, me, within us is the ability to carry out atrocities. And so, for those of you who are Mocking this issue, here is a direct example of what uh, Jordan Peterson is talking about. Right. <laughs> so you're not consistent again. Yeah. yeah. Y- you're, 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 Thank you. What is the, where's your line for consistency? Yep. So because here are two guys, here are people who are, you know, and um, Masha Gessen, before we kind of break down the psychology of it, uh, Masha Gessen is a writer at the New Yorker, great writer. I wish I could write like her. And she wrote uh, an article called "By Separating Families at the Border, the Trump Administration Enforces the Rule by Nobody." In depersonalizing the separation of asylum seekers and their children at the southern border, the Trump administration officials are signaling that no one will account for the violence. This is how violence works in the world's most cruel and terrifying societies. Actually, let me start from the beginning. Donald Trump said the Democrats made him do it. Jeff Sessions uh, said it was the Bible. Kristen Nielsen said it was the law. They all said it wasn't them. In their unified defense of the policy of separating children from their families at the border, administration officials have adopted a technique of deflection that renders victims and critics powerless. They have depersonalized the violence. This is how violence works in the world's most cruelest and terrifying societies. The victims of genocide, ethnic cleansing, and mass deportations, mass incarceration, man-made famines, and the disasters that humans intentionally visit on the quote-unquote other are always anonymous. The perpetrators portray their victims as a mass, the quote-unquote animals of Trump's imagination. Although I do quibble with that. He was talking about MS-13 and their animals. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, Donald Trump was not talking about all immigrants. He was talking about MS-13. Or the enemies and criminal criminals that Sessions and Nielsen conjure up when they talk about asylum seekers. For instance, you see the, the strain in our comment thread on this Facebook post where basically uh, everyone's, though, they're lawbreakers, they're criminals. These are, how do we know the MS-13 isn't tricking us? You know, it's, it's those, those strains that justify the, the, the examples on the extreme end of the behaviors that justify the, the, the treatment. I'm sure there were some Jewish bankers who really did rip people off. Yes. <laughs> and those those small percentages of examples end up leading to all the Jews being put in a ghetto over a few years. Mm-hmm. The, the other thing is with the, um, how do you know this is not MS-13 tricking us? MS-13 is armed to the teeth. And ambushing someone out in the middle of the desert, especially a border guard who... I'm sorry, they are armed, but there's like one or two of them in a truck. Right. They are armed and they are trained, but there's two. There's only two. The uh, the other thing is like it's, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right with this whole Jordan piece and talk about that because, and the other thing that gets me with a lot of these people, these same libertarians like to wrap themselves in the, the feel-good blankie of the Oath Keepers. The Oath Keepers will keep me safe. Right. They, they they will follow their oath and they they, they 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 will make sure stuff like this don't happen to American citizens. Yeah, but if you can do this to someone just because you don't know them because they speak a different language, 
And it's just a hop and a skip to do just because, you know, I don't care if this person's from California. I don't care. They aren't going to protect you. You have to protect yourself. And you have to speak out when things like this happen because you don't want it to become so prevalent in your society that it becomes the norm. Correct. I'm not despairing. That's why so many people are concerned about the separations and about this treatment. We don't want this to become the norm. Right. Plain and simple. We're not arguing for open borders. We're saying this isn't the norm. And we're this is the this is where we're drawing the line. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to disparage oath keepers. I'm not trying to just 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 spit on their honor honor and say like they're the, the despicable people. I'm just saying that they're human. They're human, just like those humans sitting at the desk. Right. When Trump blames the cruelty at the border on the Democrats, when Sessions says that God made him enforce the law indiscriminately, or when Nielsen claims, in effect, to just be following orders, the nation's top officials are not merely lying, they're depersonifying the perpetrators. They are not merely refusing to be held accountable, but are saying that no one will account for the violence. Now, I should say, Gessen is a writer that has lived in Russia, has been persecuted in Russia, uh, has been an uh, she she wrote another article that's really good uh, called taking children from their parents as a form of state terror where she talks about her her instance of her daughter being threatened by Putin's government in Russia uh, and I thought that was very interesting um, so the Trump administration didn't invent this tactic the Russian president Vladimir Putin has perfected it over the years he has denied knowledge of arrests trials or even people of whom he was doubtless aware he has shrugged his shoulders and spread his arms in a gesture of helplessness while claiming that the Russian judiciary is independent from the executive branch a blatant intentional lie that communicates that no one will be held accountable for political prosecutions but of course Putin didn't invent this deflection technique either Writing about the relationship between violence and bureaucracy, Hannah Arendt said, In a fully developed bureaucracy, there is nobody left with whom one could argue, to whom one could present grievances, on whom the pressures of power could be exerted. She called bureaucracy the rule by nobody. Trump, um, and, and, you know, Arendt called them administrative massacres. And that really, um, we have such a big bureaucracy that we can't let bureaucracy be in charge, and Donald Trump is kind of shrugging his shoulders and saying, eh, I'm not in charge, the bureaucracy is. You know, Sessions is saying, here's the policy, but not articulating what they should do. So Border Patrol agents are making the t- decisions on the border. That's not the rule of law. That's the rule of man. That is the rule of bureaucracy. That is the rule of nobody. And, and that is not America. These are not American values. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... Why Border Patrol Agents Obey Immoral Orders, found in Vox today. Uh, It is easy and necessary to judge the decisions of bureaucrats, but the conditions they face are enormously complicated and often make it more difficult for them to act ethically. I asked Zaka about the reasons behind this and what we could do to create bureaucracies that encourage people to do what's right, even when they're asked or pressured to do the opposite. Uh, it's easy, and, and I want to read. I want to visit this because I think for libertarians, especially, we're so anti-government that we, when we say bureaucracy, it almost it almost has become a dehumanizing term. Like there isn't a person who loves their country working in a bureaucracy or in the swamp, and so that dehumanization is a problem because when you can't actually have a conversation about them or with them mm-hmm. then you end up demonizing them and then you end up executing them <laughs> and so you, you bureaucrats are americans who are making these decisions the people who are working for the border patrol the people who are working for the department of homeland security the people who are doing this are human beings who are probably greatly conflicted with the decisions that they are making they are not just so if you are the type of person who is angry about this, then you have to realize that there are people who are doing this who probably are having the same level of emotional stress as the children themselves. And they are morally complicit in what is happening to those children, and they should feel stress about it. They should feel guilty about it. But what happens is that they start to rationalize it. Much as people don't want to hear the story of what is actually happening to these children and taking responsibility for their part in it by supporting it, 
uh, and making excuses to divert the emotional stress of it. That's what these guys do too. Um, <clears throat> so he says, it's helpful to distinguish between two sorts of predicaments. There are cases where the directives you receive are clear but morally troubling, and cases where the directives themselves are vague and ambiguous. The first type of case arises when bureaucracies have lost their moral compass, and as a bureaucrat, you must find the strength necessary to say no, or the resilience to live with yourself having said yes. You might think that this is the kind of situation the Border Patrol agents are facing right now. The second sort of case arises more often in bureaucracies. When the law runs out, bureaucrats must resort to a variety of standards to guide their action. They must at the very least strive to be efficient, fair, responsive, and respectful. Knowing how to weigh these values against one another and dealing with the conflicts that occur between them requires people to exert complex moral judgment in the thick of everyday work. Both types of cases are difficult to negotiate but challenging in different ways. In the aftermath of World War II, many scholars appro approached bureaucracy as an industrial phenomenon, a bit like a Ford Fordist production line. If all you do is pull a lever alongside thousands of others who are doing similarly minute tasks, none of you may be quite aware that you're producing a weapon. The repetitiveness of the work and the lack of contact with those who will be on the receiving end of it has a way of numbing our moral sensibilities. But things are different when you're a welfare worker, a police officer, or a border patrol agent, because you are directly intervening in people's lives. You know you are separating children from their parents. You can hear the tears and hear the screams. So the mechanism that explains why you can go home and live a normal life has to be different. That's something I try to flesh out in the book that he wrote. If I were to sum it up, I'd say this. As a frontline worker, it's not that bureaucracy bureaucracy shields you from experiencing morally agonizing situations, but that it exposes you to them so frequently that you must develop psychological coping mechanisms that reduce the strain. And that's how indifference comes about. Uh, he wrote, When the State Meets the Street is the name of his book. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people try to gain their self-respect and... Uh, and, and so people need to keep their self-esteem as a matter of survival, and so they come up with all kinds of different ways to 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 deal with what they're actually doing. And I think that disconnected that first type of bureaucrat who is just a cog in the wheel. That is a lot of people in Congress and Washington D.C. And then you get the people who are teachers, for instance. I think this is a very common problem in our in our society is that. You know, you've got these bureaucrats coming up with, you know, you hear it all the time if you talk to like a teacher. Who comes up with this stuff? Who makes these rules? Right. Certainly nobody who's ever taught. Mm -hmm. It's the person who, it, it, and this is the way the American system works. This is why I don't believe in conspiracy theories. The government is so big that there's these individual little cogs who are all doing their little daily tasks, but they don't see the massive death machine that they're building <laughs> around them. Mm -hmm. And then it's the frontline government workers, the soldier, the CPS person, the border patrol agent, the teacher, the, the police officer, the people who are on the front line. Libertarians, those are our friends because those are the people who can tell you these are the things that are wrong. I don't understand why they're wrong, but I can tell you this just doesn't make sense as a person who is doing this. Who is making these rules? You know, and so America is a system of all these little bureaucrats making all these little rules and building a little death machine. <laughs> I mean, this am I wrong? No, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, and and it's and, and it pushes and it explains a lot of different times that the um the trauma that a lot of the cops have, you see that these a lot of the especially the newer younger cops that they haven't got the better coping mechanism and that's why you usually see a lot of the younger cops in like these um, action shootings or getting in trouble with the law when they're interacting with people because their coping mechanisms makes them you know interact either like out of out of procedure or they follow procedures to such a degree that you know it just looks it just it's awful it's because it's bureaucracy on parade right um, and you feel, and so it makes you feel bad for like I feel bad for that person. And and so what I would like everyone to not be is a useful idiot. Have you ever heard of the term useful idiot? Yes. All right. So a useful idiot was coined by Lenin, and it is basically the the person standing on the sidelines giving uh, 
basically complicit in the action by giving it support and defending the action. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they are the ones who allow themselves to be snowed by a demagogue. They are the ones who allow themselves to be propagandized. And when I see the border debate on both sides of this issue, I see a lot of useful idiots. Mm-hmm. And it's more prevalent on the right than it is on the left in this in this particular situation where you see people saying things that aren't true. Like the Democrats didn't craft a law that made this happen. That's just not true. Trump Trump is powerless. The Trump the presidency uh, the president is powerless. He's he's just Chuck Schumer hasn't passed a law. He 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 is powerless to get anything done. The president of the United States is not a powerless figure. <laughs> As Lincoln said in the Lincoln movie, I'm clothed in immense power. I you know the the president of the United States crafted this policy. He's literally like putting it's like blazing saddles. He's putting the gun to his head, and he's saying, "Don't make me do it." Oh, please do what he say. Do what he say. Like, look at this. <laughs> like he's the one who three D printed the gun, and put it to his head. Like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's crazy to me. So those are the useful idiots, the people who say things that just aren't true. Like, they broke the law. They need to go back. Well, we're talking about asylum seekers. Those people didn't break the law. They're trying to do it legally. They're trying to come through the process legally. Well, they need to go back where they came from. Well, that's not how this works. <laughs> yeah, there, yeah. there will literally, there, there will always be people wanting to come to America because America is the greatest country on the planet. Mm-hmm. It, it still is one of the most free. It is, by and large, the freest country on the planet. I'm allowed mm-hmm. to have a podcast. The government hasn't yep. knocked in my door and told me to stop criticizing the government yet. Uh, we're economically free. Mm-hmm. We're we're socially free. We're politically free. We're we're a great country still, mm-hmm. and people want to come here. And if you believe that Donald Trump is making America great again, then why wouldn't you want people to come here? Right. But you also have to realize, like, there the numbers of of people coming to the border are massively massively decreased. It was one or two million a year in the two thousands, early two thousands, and now it's like four hundred thousand. So we we don't have a crisis on the border. We don't have a massive migrant wave. Mm-hmm. That makes you a useful idiot when you say that sort of thing. Yeah, you you become a useful idiot, a tool of a demagogue who is manipulating the public when you say things like, um, "Well, Paul Manafort's kids don't get to see him." It's the same thing. Doug Mataconis wrote a great article at Outside the Beltway called "Trump Supporters Draw False Equivalence Between Immigrant Families and Criminals." To start with, someone who is convicted of, to pick an example, armed robbery isn't sent to prison unless they've been found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt by an, at- an appropriate tribunal. That is not the case with people seeking asylum at the border. At best, the most they can be charged with is improper entry into the U.S., which is, generally speaking, a misdemeanor rather than a felony. Um, while it's possible for someone to be jailed for a misdemeanor, it's not common except in the case of serious violent misdemeanors or if the defendant has a pre-existing criminal record. Second, if a person is convicted or accused of a crime or held in jail or prison, their children are not placed in mass detention facilities like the children at the border. In those cases, they are either placed in the custody of the other parent, if that person can't be located, or an appropriate family member, and if one can be found, and uh, assuming that doing so would not be detrimental to the child for some reason. Uh, third, it is... Crucial to remember that the vast majority of the parents who have been impacted by the new Trump policy administration are seeking asylum rather than merely being undocumented immigrants who were caught trying to sneak across the border with their children. That's a huge difference. Um, so he, he, he talks about, uh, you know, we don't have a welfare. We, we, don't, we don't have a system of orphanages in the United States anymore. We, as a society, decided that orphanages were cruel, and this policy is creating new orphanages. We decided as a society that that isn't beneficent, beneficial to children. This is taking us back to a time when things are not healthy for children. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. These children who get separated from their parents, and, and this is a crucial piece of information that I didn't get to earlier, but many of these kids end up staying in the United States. So you've separated these children, 
and they end up going to live with other family members. 99% of the time, it's a very high number, they end up being placed with a family member, and a very minuscule amount end up in foster care. So most of them do end up being placed with a family member. But now you've got a little kid who is being placed usually with um, a first, uh, either an undocumented, a first, second generation immigrant themselves, lower economic status, and they're emotionally traumatized because of the Trump policy over the last four months. So you now have a psychopath in the train. <laughs> like, who do you think will make up MS-13 in 18 years? Well, let's be honest, 13 years. These kids, because you've emotionally damaged them with your stupid-ass policy. Like, there's no thinking. The, the other misnomer is two-thirds of the... Uh, the the people who are coming across the border do not make up most of the illegal immigrants in this country. Two-thirds are people who are here on expired visas. Those are people that have been let into the country and then their visas expired and nobody followed up with them and they didn't turn themselves in to leave, obviously. It is not the people coming across the southern border. These people generally pose no threat to us. Are there exceptions to the rule? Are there MS-13 gang members? Yes. Are there are there probably ISIS probably very low are, are there da- are there child traffickers coming across the border yes is it a large percentage or even a small percentage no the facts don't bear that out at all and so when you repeat things that aren't true you become a useful idiot you are allowing propaganda to continue to achieve a, a, a political aim that is immoral. And then you become immoral yourself. And so you have to choose what do you believe. Um, so let's see. I want to... We're, we're, nearing, we're nearing the end, believe it or not. No, but <laughs> I told you there's a lot here. We've got a lot going on. Um, let's see. So, Harry, we've got... Uh, Little news updates. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got the future of the policy. Let's talk about the drug war. Uh, let's. Oh, let's read this headline and then we'll move on to. So, what should we do about it? Okay, we've talked a little bit about that, but um, uh, yeah, let's let's just read this headline. U.S. placed immigrant children with traffickers. Oops. So the kids are in the detention facility, they get moved to the to the next facility, then they get placed with uh with family members and those that that minority that gets placed with foster care. Uh the Senate's permanent subcommittee on investigations opened its inquiry after law enforcement uncovered officials uh un- officials uncovered a human trafficking ring in Marion, Ohio last year. Uh, at least six children were lured to the U.S. from Guatemala with the promise of a better life and then were made to work on egg farms. The children, as young as 14, have been in federal custody before being entrusted to the traffickers. Your government at work. Um, so let's let's talk about some things that we can do. First and foremost, let's talk about ending the drug war. Okay, how's that sound, Harry? Sounds great. This is a big one. This is a big, this is a big hunk. Then we'll talk about the little hunks. Um, so this is a great article called Want to Reduce Illegal Immigration and the Drug War. Again, all the show prep uh, will be on wearelibertarians.com. Uh, anyone who speaks to undocumented in- immigrants regularly knows that they invariably view dangerous and expensive trips to the U.S. as a last resort, usually because something went horribly wrong at home not because of dreams of having a child who was a U.S. citizen. Um, In Mexico, for example, a former President Felipe Calderon's frontal assault on the country's cartels, continued by his successor Enrique Nieto, has cost more than 100,000 lives, according to some estimates. This article was written in 2015, by the way. Uh, For the last five years, Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras have topped the list of the country from which the U.S. receives the most asylum applications. In the last year alone, the number totaled 120,000. When 68,000 unaccompanied minors and a similar number of mothers traveling with children crossed into the U.S. from Central America illegally, they generally didn't disappear into the shadows, as the talking point goes, 
most of them turned themselves into border officials and asked for asylum or some other form of humanitarian relief. Those who managed to get access to a lawyer, which isn't easy have, ha, when you have no money and aren't entitled to a public defender, usually when are allowed to stay. Um, the violence and intimidation that comes with the ongoing drug war drove the vast, vast majority of these people from their homes. Some of the violence is spurred by warring cartels fighting to control routes to the lucrative U.S. drug market. Other times, it's brutal street gangs that intimidate business owners and residents by forcing them to pay protection fees and scare children into their ranks under the threat of death. Even government forces attacking their own civilians, often with total impunity. The U.S. government has spent more than $2.3 billion fighting the drug war in Mexico over the last seven years, but rarely criticizes abuses committed by the security forces it finances. Man, does that not sound... Uh Exactly like the United States government, Harry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, legalizing the recreational use of marijuana should be a no-brainer for policymakers who are seriously concerned about national security and the integrity of our own criminal justice system. Public health concerns, however, make crafting policies that would eliminate the black market for more other harmful drugs less straightforward. So if you drain them of their money, the cartels in these other countries lose their power. Moves them on to a different cash crop. Right. Unfortunately, that ends up moving them to sex trafficking. Sex trafficking, all like that. Child slavery. <clears throat> yeah, but the other thing is, but they're also d- drowned into a lot of the, you know, that's just poor economic sta- standards that they have because of the governments that they have that the right. United States government backed up because they wanted cheap co- cheap coffee back in the 1950s. Which yep. Then sprawled out to what we have here now because then a lot of other different countries started to make coffee like. Um, like think Brazil, a lot of people think Brazil could make good coffee. Now they make great coffee, very inexpensive coffee, and brought down the price of coffee because anyway, this goes into coffee, an important thing, and reason, another reason why a lot of the because it's all the different crops that are happening in Central America that and are just you have to like I said, like the whole the diversifying the portfolio. Each of those c- c- countries, so many of them, just like put their backs onto like one type of crop. Instead of selling their government's weapons, I think we'd be. It would be better if our companies spent more time trading with them. Trading <laughs> with know? yeah, trading with them and like, return that money that we're shipping for weapons to yeah. American taxpayers, so we can then grow the economy. Correct. So we can buy more goods from Central and South America. Yeah, and but the the, the problem is also you, you can also feel like uh, what, uh, United States companies are also gun shy because of different like laws, which said the Trump administration have put in about ha- putting things down there. It's like you're shipping American jobs down. Like no, no, we're just putting a bottling camp uh, right. comp- company down here to so it's cheaper to sell sodas down there, and they want real sugar sodas. The Americans are fine with high fructose corn syrup. Right. But they also gun shot because, um, let's see, like Venezuela took over a lot of the, like, the Kellogg's plant. They took over the Coca-Cola bottling plant. So they're also gun shot with moving down there to be careful. They don't get too close to some of these like ridiculous socialist regimes in the South American yeah. uh, countries down there. So. so my solution is we need to take a look at how our policies on drugs is impacting these countries – uh, how uh, we should stop sending weapons to these countries. We should stop sending cash to these countries. Uh, we should end the black market that funds the gangs in these countries. Mm-hmm. We should decriminalize the drug that, that initially we should starve the local gangs, MS-13. When you legalize all drugs, crime dramatically drops because there's no black market anymore for them to be funded. So if you really hate MS-13, it isn't about sealing the borders. It is about starving them of the funding that they feed off of. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, taking that with the, um, the, the the economics they use to build themselves out of. Yep. Because without money, they're just 23-year-olds hanging out Yep. when it comes down to it. Right. And the only reason they're doing it is because this is the path to make money. Uh, So as to the specific plan itself that Trump enacted four months ago, not the Democrats, (laughs) Donald Trump, Mm -hmm. uh, the New York Times reported today Trump plans executive order to allow detaining families together indefinitely. Uh, Trump said, we're going to be signing an executive order in a little while. We've got to keep the families together. President Trump is preparing to issue an executive order as soon as Wednesday that ends separation of families at the border. He's basically going to do a fix on that 97 uh, decree 
Uh, and the the problem is, where's the, I didn't highlight the actual legal part. Um, while Trump's actions appear to stop short of, of calls for an end to the zero tolerance policy, it should it would be a remarkable retreat for a president who has steadfastly refused to apologize in almost any other context. All right, see, New York Times, that might be why people think you're the liberal media. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, there is a part in here that I don't – I'm, I'm not seeing. I wish I had highlighted. Oh, the order would keep families together, though it is unclear how Mr. Trump intends to claim the legal authority to violate what have been legal constraints on the proper treatment of children in government custody. So essentially he can put this executive order in place. It could be legally challenged. It may – probably would get overturned. But I cannot imagine uh, a liberal group that would challenge President Trump on this. Uh, I could see maybe some conservative groups. That would be interesting if the Jay Seculos of the world, the tr- private lawyer, mm-hmm. he would be the most likely to sue over this. <laughs> what a crazy <laughs> world we're living in, man. Um, if, as for the congressional fixes, there are four, or there are several. Uh, no single proposal has enough uh, to pass. This is from Vox. Congress's chaotic scramble to address Trump's family separation border policy explained. Uh, there is... DiFi, uh, let's see, where's the title of this? Uh, oh, the Keep Families Together Act. Senator Dianne Feinstein has a proposal which has the support of every single single uh, Senate Democrat that would outlaw family separations except in very specific cases when there's reason to believe a child is being trafficked or abused by his or her parents. The bill would only allow a family to be separated if a state court terminated an unauthorized immigrant's parental rights or an official from a state or county child welfare agency decided it was in the best interest of the child to be removed. So the federal government wouldn't be involved. Um, Republicans have already found issue with the proposal, calling it a return to catch and release. When a family seeking asylum is released from custody and told to return for a future court and told to return, I've never seen this word, T-O-R-E-T-O-R-N, for a future court date, uh, Senator Cotton hates it, but Senator Cotton's the worst senator in the entire Senate, and that includes John McCain. Um, so to protect the Protect Kids and Parents Act, Ted Cruz has a proposal that has already earned a lot of support from Republicans. The bill would essentially create an expedited 14-day process for asylum cases and double the number of immigration judges on the border from 375 to 750. It would also authorize new temporary shelters that could accommodate families and mandate that unauthorized immigrant families be kept together as long as there isn't criminal conduct or a threat to the child. Trump, uh, many have called this for a fast asylum process unrealistic and say it could result in more people being deported than granted asylum. And Trump has rejected the idea, mischaracterizing the proposal to increase border judges in in a speech to small business owners. He instead reiterated support for the border wall. Ultimately, we have to have a real border, not judges. Thousands and thousands of judges they want to hire. Who are these people? Okay. Uh, John Cornyn from Texas has a working group. Uh, the thing about Cruz, Cruz is in a tough Senate fight. Uh, Cruz was, you know, very grandstandy and mm-hmm. uh, went down to the border in 2014 when this happened. Uh, he is taking the opportunity to look like he's got a fix uh, for his re-election efforts, but hey, seems fine to me. Um, a group of Republican senators led by Cornyn, the number two Senate Republican, are also working to draft legislation. Uh, it's not entirely clear what would be in the proposal. Cornyn said he's looking to revive his 2014 Helping Unaccompanied Minors and Alleviating National Emergency Act, the Humane Act, which would require a judge to rule on a migrant child's case within 72 hours. Um uh, others in this group, like Cotton, called for an overrule of the Flores settlement. So that way, 20 days after, they wouldn't be kicked out. Uh, because here's the, the Republican object- objection with the Flores thing. They, What Republicans really want is they want to get rid of the Flores decree that says that after 20 days, the kid needs to be moved out of detention mm-hmm. and, and, and settled with a family member. 
the reason they want to get rid of that is they want to basically detain indefinitely families, <laughs> which isn't a great solution. If that's what they're arguing for, that's a, that's a no go for me, because you could have you could have these people being a ward of the state, and like that's what the crazy thing that most of conservatives are arguing is they're arguing for the federal government to pay for all these kids to be housed. They're creating wards of the state. They're creating. Guantanamo Bay for refugees on U.S. soil, on US soil up and down the border, and we have to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Billions of dollars of years. I mean, and, and because the process is so slow. Mm-hmm. That's why the catch and release method is it, it, because they have to go feed themselves. They have to go find their own shelter. They have to go start settling, and then they meet with the judge, and then they decide their asylum case. Right. And yeah, people absolutely don't show up for that meeting. They just disappear into the system. But under the authority of Trump and with zero tolerance, that's still happening because these kids are disappearing into the system. I mean, there was one article I didn't get to where kids are just completely disappearing from their parents. Like parents are returning to their home countries and have no idea what happened to their kid and not in a small amount of cases, like a large percentage of the cases, kids are just disappearing into the United States, like five-year-olds. It's crazy. Crazy. Hundreds of thousands of kids over the last few years have just dispersed into the United States. We have no idea where they're at, no idea. Their parents have no idea. No record, no database, nothing. Right. Nothing. So they're already here in the United States. They are getting, they're going to get education. They're going to get uh, yep. health care, yep. whole nine yards, which they could, you know, we could have forced their parents to do that on their own. And in a lot of cases, it's cheaper when you grant asylum because home countries have to pay for a lot of stuff. So takes it out of the foreign aids, right? And well, they also will like will just work and go do it themselves, right? Because they can't stay on the welfare programs. Um, Tillis, Tom Tillis from North Carolina, Republican, has a uh, one that looks like Cruz's, uh, with more border judges, more detention space, but will also pull language from Feinstein's proposal around protections against children for traffickers. Uh, this is an interesting poll, um, Fox News poll. Came out on uh, September 2017. 83% support pathway to citizenship for illegal immigrants. Uh, okay. At the time, Fox polling found 54%. Uh, so, so basically, the Dreamer Law, uh, per- percentage of voters, percentage of voters saying extremely or very important Congress pass each. Dreamer Law, 62%. 58% for health care reform, 52% for tax reform. Um, former President Obama amount, announced DACA in June 2012. And at that time, Fox polling found 54% supported the change. Now it's 62 as of uh, late last year. Um, for illegal immigrants who were brought to the U.S. as children, uh, 86%. Favor work permits, 79% favor U.S. citizenship. What should happen to illegal immigrants working in the U.S.? Legalize now, 83%. Legalize them. Uh, There is rare partisan agreement on all fronts. Democrats, 66%, Republicans, 60%, and Independents, 59%, all agree it is important Congress work on Dreamer legislation. 63% of Trump voters favor granting Dreamer citizenship. Setting up a system to legalize undocumented immigrants working in the U.S. also re- re- receives bipartisan support. 95% of Democrats, 68.9% of Republicans, and 82% of Independents want legalization for Dreamers to happen. So, uh, <laughs> you're out of arguments. <laughs> like, uh, it took me two and a half hours. But you're just out of arguments. This policy needs to be ended completely. Yeah, cost too much money. To to the left, uh, you know, for for Trump, um, it it is so mystifying that he just snatches victory from the jaws of defeat. Like the guy just walks off of the North Korea summit. It was amazing. It was mm-hmm. beautiful, and, and it was his most popular initiative ever. And now 
he has done something that has so massively backfired that he has uh, those numbers are from September 2017. I can't wait to see what the new numbers look like mm -hmm. because what Donald Trump has done is he has for most Americans disconnected the immigration argument from racial bias mm -hmm. <laughs> and and put it into the realm of empathy for children. Right. What Stephen Miller and Donald Trump did, they don't realize it yet. They have massively fucked their own position. Mhm. Mm because now most Americans are not looking at this as an issue of nationalism and patriotism. They are now looking at it as a matter of empathy. We must have more immigrants allowed into this country because you're bad, because you're evil. And so by taking the strong, tough approach, you have backfired and given your opponents, the very people that disagree with you, a boost. Mm -hmm. everything, they, everything they wanted, everything they needed— but and it's only to deal with the 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 pain that no one wanted to deal with. They right. didn't want to deal with it. No one wanted to talk about it. No one wanted to deal with it. And we and that the thing is like allowing them in is the most right position to have. That's like as far as is right you can get. That lack of control there. Right. That's what freedom is. Everyone's like that's not that's this leftist crap. No, fr this is freedom. No chaser. Here we go. Let's go. Raw dog. Let's do this. Let's do this. <laughs> Raw dog. Right. You know, like I want to control that. No, 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 no. That's that's government there. That's government control there. <laughs> uh, one other thing that Trump is doing that has flying flown under the radar. This is again from Masha, I guess, in the New Yorker in America. Naturalized citizens no longer have an assumption of permanence. Last week, uh, this was just written yesterday or today. Last week, it emerged that U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services have formed a task force in order to identify people who lied on their citizenship applications and to denaturalize them. Amid the overwhelming flow of reports of families being separated at the border and children being warehoused, this is a bit of bureaucratic news that largely went unnoticed. Uh, historically, denaturalization has been exceedingly rare occurrences, and for good reason. By the time a person is naturalized, she or he or she has been living in this country for a number of years and has passed the hurdles of obtaining entry, legal permanent residency, and finally citizenship. The conceit of naturalization is that it makes an immigrant not only equal to a natural-born citizen, but indistinguishable from them. So denaturalization, much like the process of stripping natural-born Americans of citizenship, has been extraordinary, an extraordinary procedure reserved for very serious cases, mostly those war criminals. So they're not even now going after dreamers, the, the, the kids who don't speak their native tongue and are basically American millennials. Mm -hmm. Like um, I follow a dreamer on Twitter, uh, somebody I'd like to have on the show, and this, she just tweets about American stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like she's, oh, yeah. she's not really – like she's an American kid mm -hmm. um, you know, without, without the proper papers. Mm-hmm. It would cost eight hundred billion dollars to send all the dreamers back. It would be a massive, massive hit to the American economy, because when you allow those kids to come into the United States, those six hundred thousand dreamers, they produce, they buy, mm -hmm. they purchase, yep. they work. Mm -hmm. It's just like it just doesn't make any sense. And so, not only are they doing that, they're now going after people who are citizens but from other countries. And if they lied on their application, they're going to denaturalize them and send them back. That's a terrifying thought. I have friends who are American citizens from other countries who – what in the world do you, on what planet does he think this is a good idea? What are they going to do? They're going to do that to regular citizens? Yeah, your dad lied about his job, so right. we're revoking your citizenship. Right. What? Yeah, we're going to send you back to your country according to this 23 and Me test. That's Poland. Bye, Spangle. Right. Bye, Spangle. I, I just I don't I don't get it. Um, I don't speak the language. So, yeah, it's ridiculous. So you lose that workforce. You you invested all this money in these kids, teaching them. Through the school system, through well, your inadequate school system, and you're just gonna let them go? That doesn't yeah. sound like that's. Where's the return on investment on that? I thought you were a businessman. So now is the time in the show, Harry, where we play "I Told You So." Yeah, and this is a fun game. Okay. Uh, do we, well, you've collected some thoughts. Let's do that before we oh, close wanna, on this. You want to? You want to see some of the, the, the comments? Uh, I've do I? Do I? I don't, some Am of I them just... are, are horrendous. 
Um, this one from um, Paul. I, I think most of my personal views are libertarian, but I do believe in controlling our border. It is called national security. I'm retired FF from one of the big five uh, counties that make up Metro Atlanta. And if he thinks bad people don't come here, he should have been with me in the height of the gang wars in the mid 2000s. I don't dispute that bad people come here, and I'm not arguing for uh, like this is the this is the thing that people do in the middle of these debates when they have run out of arguments they shift the debate mm-hmm. like no, i i have not argued other than giving my opinion at the beginning for the bias hunters i have not argued about immigration i have argued about this specific policy and so you can hold the view that separating kids from their families is wrong and that donald trump is wrong without fully buying into open borders it, it like your brain should be allowed to be that flexible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you can hold two thoughts in your brain at once. I don't dispute that bad people come over. I don't dispute that. Uh, th- th- the reality is, and this is this is a common theme across any of. Uh, it, we've said it a couple times tonight. Th- there is this thinking amongst the left and right that because the government the institution of government exists and because we have people wearing border patrol uniforms that they are effective right we believe that because cps exists that children are being protected mm-hmm. we believe that because police exist that the people in chicago are not being killed the yeah. the the idea of a pure libertarian society or even a constitutional republic <laughs> is not scary to me because I understand that once you remove the perverse incentives of government, then freedom starts to flourish and that is better for human beings. Always. Because human beings are an empathetic, are, are an empathetic group. And the systemic overarching government apparatus in this specific case and in so many others, causes good people to do bad things because of perverse incentives. And so I, I, I like the idea that ISIS can't just run across our border now is like <laughs> laughable is laughable. Like, the funniest thing I've ever heard. Like just because border control exists, it doesn't mean they're actually controlling the border and you you can't close the border. You're seeing the inhumanity of a closed border. You're seeing the chaos of a closed border. And this is what so many people don't get is that you – what is the end goal of your ideology? This times two? Mm-hmm. How much money is that going to cost us? Right. Like it's it's just – it's not a reality and you're believing fantasies that don't exist. Just in – I see it the same way as you see an open border mm-hmm. as a fantasy – Dear conservative, I see the closed border as an even bigger fantasy because we just don't have the money to do it. We've got to buy a space force, okay? Uh, Nice said it would be cheaper to build the wall if we just bought all the South American, uh, Central American countries down to the Panama Canal. Right. Bought down there. It'd be cheaper. Sure. It would be cheaper. All right, next. Let's see here. This is a good one. Um, And once again, you're comparing citizen rights with non-citizens. What does that mean? You're just trying to say that the U.S. Constitution is only for U.S. citizens, not the others. Well, the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence are natural rights. So if you believe in natural rights, you believe that the rights that are inherent in the Declaration of Independence specifically, but also the Bill of Rights, uh, the, the Declaration, those rights extend to all human beings, Okay. The Bill of Rights are restraints on the United States government. The Constitution is an express written document as to how the government can interact with its citizens. So in some ways you're right, in some ways you're wrong. If you are a citizen that lives in these borders, then yes, the Constitution applies to you. But as we've seen through the course of tonight, the actions of the United States government have a wide-ranging effect across the world – and many of the things that Americans hold dear that we consider special about our country, about our founding, are natural rights that extend to all human beings. I would say that the right to uh, 
uh, not be kidnapped, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the right to not be terrorized, the right to not have your children traumatized is a pretty good good natural right. All right. Uh, I got this great write-up from the uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson Law Review, <laughs> Alien Citizens and Constitutional Rights. Okay. The Constitution does does distinguish in some respects between the rights of citizens and non-citizens, the right not to be discriminatory, denied the vote, and the right to run for federal elective office are expressly restricted to citizens. All other rights, however, are written without such limitation. The 5th and the 14th Amendment due process and equal protection guarantees extends to all persons. The rights of At, um, attaching to criminal trials, including the right to a public trial, a trial by jury, the assistance of a lawyer, and the right to confront adverse witnesses, all apply to the accused. And both the First Amendment's protections of political and religious freedoms and the Fourth Amendment's protection of privacy and liberty apply to the people. The fact that the framers chose to limit to the citizens only the rights to vote and to run for federal office is one indication they did not intend other constitutional rights to be limited. Okay. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, just read the Constitution. It doesn't have it doesn't have a start or an end. They just says these are rights of the people. Right. Other than you know, I didn't think about like the right to vote. Yeah, that's the only time it was, it was expressly written there. That and president. Yeah, that's it. That's the right. only something expressly written. And why would they put that in there yeah. if there was any other limitations? That's a really good point. Yeah. Next. All right. <clears throat> I feel horrible what happens to the kids, but why aren't they? Why aren't we prosecuting their parents for putting them in this situation? It's not like they don't already know what could possibly happen. Well, they are, <laughs> but the. Um, I wish I could. Can you can you look up the? Um, uh, there's an act uh-huh. on asylum from 1961. I don't know what it's called, but the United States um, asylum is a long held tradition uh, that really, you know, in the United States has had a huge part in the modern era in promoting asylum for refugees. You know, if you look at genocides in Rwanda, uh, there's really been a shift in the American people, and and I don't understand it other than to consider it xenophobia. Uh, and I've saved this little bit for now, but um, and now uh, that's the 1965 one. You yeah, know what that no, this is like a UN, but it's it's okay. So, asylum is an important, like. I guess I just I, I would have to ask back. I don't understand how you could could not look at that sixteen year old girl who is trying not to be kidnapped into sex slavery and say go back to your home country so we can make you a sex slave. Like the United States government, when they don't grant asylum to that girl, send her back to sex slavery. And so, what does the American? What do the American people really? If we allow a 16-year-old girl into the United States to avoid sex slavery, what are we losing out on? Like, th- there's, um, mm-hmm. I-, I would just invite you to Google the 14 most common arguments against immigration and why they're wrong from the Cato Institute. It's in the show notes too, you know, and kind of look through that and see if that challenges any of your assumptions because I think a lot of the economic arguments just they don't hold water when you apply them. Most immigrants uh, don't cost America anything um, for many different reasons. There's like a zero economic impact on immigrants. Uh, the um, as we said, you know, like things like school are paid by the home country. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Yeah. yeah. The The economic impact just isn't there. In Correct. fact, they help the economy. Yes, a lot. <laughs> like when you talk about leaving the dreamers leaving the country and it costs nearly a trillion dollars in economic loss, your brain just doesn't kind of go, "Oh, that's weird." Yeah. Think about all those people who didn't want all the like the uh, Asians in this country, and now look at Silicon Valley and probably like go kick their stupid boomer grandparents. It's like <laughs> you was going to prevent this from coming in here. I love Uber. Anyways, uh, <laughs> um, what happens to Americans couple with children commits a crime and goes to pr- prison? What happens to the children? Oh, you answer. We answer that, that yeah. one. 
Um, so you try to pass yourself off as a libertarian. I think you may need to research the idea a bit more. Try joining the left and working yourself to the right. Okay. All respect to you, but I think you need someone more understanding. Okay, so I imagine that this is probably somebody who is conservative or probably alt-right. And it's, these people generally, that when I talk to them, have been uh, paying attention to politics since Trump. And mm -hmm. so they don't really know much about politics or how government works or how anything works. They just have these, these sets of assumptions that they bring to the table. Uh, if you want to be real honest, open borders are the only tenable libertarian position because you are – you are stagnating the flow of of a commodity. You are basically tariffing human labor. You are setting up fences and using force to keep people from freely flowing. So I'm not going to say that you can't be a libertarian if you aren't an open borders person, but you sure as shit can't be a closed borders person. Like you just, I just don't think that's a tenable position. I don't think that if you really study the issue of immigration – uh, if you read something other than the Heritage Foundation research, uh, which the Heritage Foundation cherry picks their data to make immigration tenable and work economically, and their stats are just bullshit, and they constantly are refuted by people like Cato. So I just don't think that you can really be a libertarian and be a closed borders person. And this strain of, of people who somehow think that uh, the conservative view on uh, like there's this group of l people who call themselves libertarian who don't believe libertarian things like closed borders. Like, so you, sir, don't understand libertarianism. I've been around for 10 years. Uh, I have read a lot about this issue because it's something that challenges me and it still challenges me. I may, I may be five years from now going, I'm an, I'm a totally open borders person. I may get there. You know, uh, I'm definitely I've definitely evolved on the issue. And when you actually start looking at facts and figures and data and economic impacts and uh, just from a moral standpoint, you're wrong. Yeah, those are the, yeah, those are about the good ones. That OK, pick out. everything else you just pre pretty much answered. Yeah. I mean, to, to me, this is a. It's. Is, there's two. Let me say. Let me address the right since we're here. Uh, it's time for the "I told you so" portion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> since 2015, I've been saying Donald Trump is someone who doesn't have any character. Okay, he's a transactional person, which means that Donald Trump occasionally does things that I like. Sometimes my my guide star is what is best for liberty, what is best for f freeing people mm -hmm. from the tyranny of the state, and. Donald Trump does some good things for libertarians and for libertarian ideology. But at the end of the day, it doesn't make him a moral character. And, um, you know, I think when you're arguing for state terror against immigrants by separating 2,000 kids from their parents, that's using, that's using violence to send a message to people. Mm -hmm. That's immoral. Um, you know, if... I believe in the rule of law, so if we have laws in the books, they should be followed, but it also doesn't mean that you have to apply the law at the very strictest levels of the law. And he's doing this to send a message for political purposes. It's just crass, and it's gross. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a real problem when uh, your values change because your party's in the White House. Yep. True principles are constants that are used to correct the entropy of human behavior. So as human beings pull and move and change and destroy and create, we have to have those guide stars that really keep us in place. And we talked a lot about understanding what your values are in the last episode. You know, the Bible, for instance, is the most significant instrument of human liberty in the world and it's being used to justify terror, and it's gross. And so I think it's a real wake-up call for, for conservatives and uh, Trump supporters when the entire world starts to go, this is wrong. Even people like me who are independent and will give the president a fair shake, this is not good. And you're still defending it? 
I think you really need to think about where you're at and what what you're doing because you don't want to be a useful idiot. You should come from a place of truth. So if you've done your homework and you really believe that this policy is okay, fine. But I just don't get the sense in talking to many people on Facebook over the last week that they understand what they're talking about. Because I did the research and I worked really hard because – Listen, if Rich Lowry's article in the National Review had been totally right, I would I would be leading with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. You know me well enough. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're just so. like yeah. We were just totally like this is what's really going on. This is what's going on. We've done it before in the past. Oh God! Here come the atheist libertarians. Wrong about the Bible and liberty. Okay. No. No. Don't. No. 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 All right. I won't. Well, we'll stick to the subject. I just I get so tired. I. Like insulting people's religion and insulting the truth of the Bible being a great instrument of human liberty, it is. it has been used to justify some bad things like keeping kids in cages, like slavery. Mm-hmm. But by and large, it leads so many people to personal liberty. Uh, the, the, it's the church in the darkest times while the church systemically was broken at the top – they, uh, I don't want to get into it. It's, you're right. Just move See? On. Yeah. Yep. There you go. I just, it's just, just, I, I hate. Just let it go. Trust me. If you think I don't like conservatives after tonight, go listen to episodes of when I hate it on the left. Mm-hmm. Listen to every episode and realize I hate libertarians the most. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the left. So I've consistently said that the hyperbole used about Donald Trump is a problem. Because there's going to come a day and time when something will truly be wrong and no one is listening to you anymore. Right. And so part of the problem in trying to have a conversation with Trump supporters about this and why they don't understand the truth is because you guys can't stop screaming, he's literally Hitler. Mm -hmm. So crafting public opinion is a very... Um, important thing, and it requires a lot of run responsibility, and the left has not used that over the last three years. And we are seeing some of the consequences now. And the fact that the left can't control themselves and have to make everything the greatest scandal in history, the, the R- Russia investigation being number one, and it's completely uh, a phony investigation at this point, you are partly responsible for the misery of these kids being prolonged because nobody believes the boy that cried wolf anymore. So use your words wisely. But um, I don't know. It, it's, a, it's been a depressing story for me because – and two, two counts – To me, America has, oh, if you look at the history of America, America, by and large, yes, we have done things that have, you know, slavery was a bad thing, Harry. Yes. Yes, it was. I'm sure you're, you're against it, even though your family were slave traders. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but we're the country that ended slavery. We're the country that gave women the right to vote. Mm-hmm. We're the country that... Fought a war to end slavery. Fought a war to end slavery. Yeah. We're we're a country by and large that does good things. Mm-hmm. We're we're a country that, even though I don't agree with humanitarian aid, does humanitarian aid. We're the ones who invented that. <laughs> right. Everybody else was colonial. We were inventing yeah. foreign aid. We disagree with the idea of trying to be the world's policeman, but the United States Navy. That's what they do. Had a pretty peaceful past seventy years, thanks to the United States. Yeah. The United States Navy ensures that most. Uh, 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 ships make it from port to port to port and not getting stuff with Somali pirates. That's why you heard like this bip of pirates and then you stopped. The United States Navy took care of them. Right. Yes. The reason that the world is better because of America is because America puts liberty and freedom first. And we help the downtrodden. Mm-hmm. And we use our place of privilege. And I don't say that in the SJW way. I mean that in the sense that we are a rich country that can do a lot of good around the world. At least that's the story that we tell ourselves. Right. If it's just a fairy tale, phony story that we tell ourselves, then we're not an exceptional nation. Yep. 
But we need to live up to that tag of being exceptional. We need to live up to that tag of being a country that values human life, that thinks that treating the least of us are important, at least in a decent way. We're not the type of country that uses terrorism for political purposes. And it's just disturbing to me to see so many people say that's okay. Yeah. And I think that's been the toughest part about this. Yeah. But you just dismiss it. Yep. Just let it go. It's fine. It's, it's, hey, these people deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. They need to come here legally with it, ignoring everything that they've gone through to get where they are or what they're fleeing from. Yeah. yeah. I just, I just. And the natural disasters, the gang violence, the. Like empathy to me is an important value, and I think if you if you are trying to craft policy, you have to really think about the human cost of that policy. Mm-hmm. And many people are not able to extend that empathy of themselves and their family to these human beings yep. because they're brown. Yep, and and it's not like uh, the United States government doesn't do this to its own citizens. If there's several episodes of the cost of watching, you know, mm-hmm. you know them doing that to you know U.S. citizens. Yep. All right, Harry, what do you, let's end this. My voice is going. Can you hear it? It's yeah. a little weak. Yeah, that's good. You know, I'm going to save that so you can shout at Roger face-to-face. Yes, I am going to Porkfest tomorrow. I, I have a flight at 7.30 a.m. I will be at Porkfest tomorrow evening and then all day Friday, and then I come back Saturday. No, it's going to feel weird. You at Porkfest, not me. Not you. No, this is weird. I know. Okay. Right. Harry, uh, final thoughts. The the thing is, what now? This is something that I try to get to different people, and this has helped me with some people at my job and discussing borders with them, because my policy is borders are silly things that governments and things create, and then I like to take them just on a drive around the town and show them how often we will cross town borders, as I will cross into Lawrence, to Indianapolis, to McCordsville, to Fortville. You know, Hancock County, Marion County, drawing all around Unigov, going into Speedway. These are technically borders. I'm crossing into town. Now, granted, they're like, whoa, they're, 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 they're part of this, this same system. Yes, but even with them, they have their own same towns, rules, laws, taxes. They have all these different different police jurisdictions. They have all these different things that you, from these different lines. But you are free to cross this for travel, for commerce. Because there's part of the this one union that they have, that's it. That's all you needed. That's that's what makes it okay. That's this way, that's that, to me that they're just different lines of different organizations have different tax reasons. And with and it, it's 2018, the if, current year, it's current year. If you can't collect taxes from people because you want your theft money so bad and you want people to follow your your rules in your little town, guess what? If they break the law here. We deal with them. That's what. Right. That's what the United States would do. That's what would do. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, assuming that everybody who crosses the border is automatically uh, a a bad person who has committed a crime, like crossing a border is a victimless crime. Yeah, victimless crime. And you can you can concoct some fairy tale that it's a victim that causes this blah blah blah. Yeah. It's this moral. It's not. It's a victimless crime. Yeah. Sixty sixty some percent of the people who were deported last year committed a victimless crime. Mm-hmm. So, the, the, to me, enforcement, Obama really focused on the people who were violent, the gang members. We have limited resources, and mm-hmm. from a practical standpoint, focus on the people who are the most violent, the people who are the least valuable yep. to our society, and get them the hell out of here. Yep. Capitalism will teach us to, we have... The United States government is supposed to have scarce resources of cash, of theft money they stolen from us. Right. So they use this scarce resources and they should spend it wisely. Just burning money to go after everything and everything. Yeah, that's just that's that's not capitalism. That's statism on parade. That's no. That's that. If that had a budget, it they would have blown through it. They they wouldn't be protect the border for the rest of the months then. Right. But they're allowed to keep ballooning and get. Putting more money, and when you think that money is going to come from, it's got to come from somewhere. Right. It's not free. You can protect the border, but it ain't going to be free. There's no free lunch, just like for everything else. That has to come from. Those are jobs. Those are buildings. Those things are heated. They're cool. There's food. There's 
that there's all kinds of different things are in in play there. Right. It's got to come from somewhere. You want to balance the budget, not pay for the other stuff. Well, guess what? Catch release means you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> so. All right. Well, Harry, it was good to have you back. Good to be back. I like being back. I like seeing all the comments. Everyone's happy to see me back. I'm actually shocked. All these people was happy to see me back. I'm, <laughs> Well, if you I love have missed this place. if you love uh, some Harry, then how can you watch Low Key Wall? You can watch Low Key Wall. You can uh, either uh, subscribe to the Patreon feed and get that one, or you can also get it live on Friday nights on Twitch TV. We move from Wednesday nights to Friday nights. I might move it back to Wednesday night because uh, you know it's a little rough, but I kind of like the Friday nights thing because I'm actually I think I might even open back up the old studio in the basement of my house and then just invite Reinhold and Paul just down to the basement of the studio at my house right after we leave Liberty and chill. Fun, yeah, should be fun. All right. For my part, I want to thank uh, Christy Avery, Craig DaCosta, and Jason Doolittle for their uh, support of We Are Libertarians, and uh, to everyone who funded my uh, trips to Porkfest. I forget your names right now, but I greatly appreciate it. I am uh, a little too tired to. Rem- uh, I should, uh, I should write that down. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and all of our Patreon supporters, you guys are are making it happen. You guys are allowing me to travel and cover events and uh, give you the what's what's up. What's hap? What what do the kids say now? The what's happening? Is that what they say? Why would you look for me to see what's happening? That's I know you're less cool than I am. Yep, I had to to go pick up my dad's shoes the other day. Did you get a pair of New Balance or Nikes? I went for the New Balance. Okay, all right. I'm a Nike man, but I'll forgive you. All right, thanks for joining us on this episode of We Are Libertarians. I will be recording live Friday morning. Uh, I won't be live, um, but I will be recording Friday morning, and then I'll post it when I get back on uh, Sunday. If you're going to get up on Friday, don't forget to uh, find Ernest Hancock. See if you can go side side to Ernest Hancock. Okay, I will. Uh, he should be the one screaming in the middle of pork fest. Mm-hmm. He's easy to find. Yeah. Uh, and I uh, will be at the National Libertarian Convention, so if you're going, please drop me a note at editor at wearelibertarians.com. I would love to meet up with listeners. I need to set up like an official get-together. I think I tasked Paul with that, but I don't think he's done it yet, so I need to crack the whip. Uh, <laughs> so thanks for joining us on this episode of We Are Libertarians. If you got something out of this, if you felt that this was helpful, then please share with your friends unashamedly. Tell them, uh, hey, this is what's actually going on. Uh, I would greatly appreciate it. Your shares, your word of mouth is really one of the best ways that we grow, and uh, we we want to reach as many people and keep spreading the message of libertarianism. So thank you for joining us on this episode of We Are Libertarians, and we will see you next week.